back to us on that. Uh, but uh, sufficient to say, I think I think Deloitte's done a pretty good job. I think they um, there was nothing that really surprised me about it. Uh, there was a lot of positives in it, and there was things that we we need to look at and think and consider uh, as well. So valuable to have an external uh, view <coughs> from us from a well-led point of view, and of course that will feed in uh, because the first thing the CQC when they arrive, like on a well-led like to see is a well-led report and, and what was picked up. So that was very good. Um, we've had uh, quite a lot of governor meetings uh, since the last uh, meeting. The uh, David and I uh, had a meeting, informal meeting, and we've had the first NED governor meeting uh, last week and also the constitution group uh, have met. Uh, I'm pleased to see the, and we'll come on to maternity later, uh, see that some of the Ockenden uh, things in action really, that, that having an ed safety champion uh, and people feeling uh, empowered to talk to them uh, has led us to uh, do some more actions around maternity and we'll come on to that later. But I was, I was just pleased that, you know, the things that we had put in place are, are working and that more to the point that our people feel empowered to raise issues when they when they uh, they think they need to. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad to see and we've talked haven't we about a measure of normality returning with the latest IPC guidance although we are making sure that that is safe for our for our people and for obviously our patients. The opening of the eternal garden I know it's in uh, David's uh, report uh, but I thought it was a great great uh, event. Um, I've had a very nice letter following that from the Lord Lieutenant, who obviously enjoyed himself. Great to see Aaron Anderson from uh, the TV uh, and local mayors there, plus the garden designers. I think that's, I had a walk around it yesterday and I would urge board members when they come in, just have a walk in there and uh, have a look around it. It's really nice and it was being used. So I didn't go into the building bit because it was being used, but the very placid uh, and nice environment in there. And, um, you know, on the on a kind of more personal level, I've I've now resumed sort of some face to face catch ups and I caught up with uh, George's and Epsom Centelia chair uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it's always helpful to have these uh, other things going on. I'm not going to say any more than that. As I say, apologies that it wasn't a written report this time, um, but that was circumstances. So I'm now going to hand over um, before we go through the actual report, I'm going to hand over to Julie. Thank you, Andy, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I thought it would be really helpful recognising that the Chief Exec's report is very much David's report this month, um, that I, I would just spend a few minutes in terms of feeding back to you in terms of my reflections as I sit here in my second week. So I will be brief and then I will hand over to David for his excellent report. Um, I really just wanted to say I've received an incredibly warm welcome from everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and it's a real privilege to take on the role of Chief Executive of Ashford and St Peter's, taking on the legacy, Suzanne's legacy, and also a huge thank you to David for filling in for me and doing the interim Chief Executive role in, in a, a really brilliant way. David and I have been in absolute conversations about the priorities that we um, all know about and that we are talking about and that we need to continue and take forward. And, and David, in a really helpful way, um, suggested that those key priorities around the main effort that we're actually starting to see some traction in terms of alternatives to admissions for our non-elective patients and the, uh, the elective recovery work that's ongoing and the elective centre at Ashford and underpinned by workforce OD work were, were the key things that we needed to do and that there would be enough work to continue the work probably for um, a number of months while I came into the organisation. So it would absolutely give me the headroom that I needed in order to um, gather my thoughts, get my feet under the table and begin to understand the key priorities that we needed to work on. Also, as there is so much change in the organisation, we were really keen 
that we provided some stability and some continuation of Suzanne through to David, through to me, and uh, very keen to communicate that to the organisation. And I think tomorrow, David, we're doing a bit of a, a sort of a double act with communications in terms of how we see things going forward and building on the great work and all the work that absolutely is, is being taken forward. Clearly, um, there are lots of keen priorities. And uh, last week, the ongoing challenges that we clearly are taking very seriously around our financial plan for 22-23 with the ongoing deficit position um, is an absolute priority and we are working very collaboratively with other providers and ICS colleagues to come up with solutions to improve that position and ensure that we're using opportunities to work at place and at system so we can prioritise and get value for money around our services so we can maintain our services for our patients. But that's absolutely a priority um, that we are continuing to work on. Clear, clearly, Surrey Safe Care, uh, with the work that Simon and the team and James are taking forward with our electronic patient record, is another priority and really good news that we are in a strong position to, to take that forward. I think alongside that, Andy's made reference to the governance well-led review from Deloitte and that clearly will be um, both a priority and an opportunity and I will be using it as a hook along with my fresh eyes into the organisation about how I might want to put some forward some suggestions around improving governance and as Andy said as we come out of Covid and um, sort of re remember different ways of working and seeing people face to face <laughs> I will, I will be keen that when we come out of Surrey Safe Care and free up some of our meeting room capacity, that there will be an opportunity to um, see each other and have some more face-to-face -face meetings, but not to lose the benefit of what we've learned through COVID and how we can work in a more agile way together. So really the best of both going forward. So I am going to use this period of time um, as a bit of a luxury to really focus on my induction and get to know people and to meet people both here um, within the trust but across the system and at place. I do have a very long list of people to see. If you feel that you're not on that list please drop me an email and I will absolutely reach out to see you. Um, Again, I'm going to use this time to consider what my key chief executive objectives need to be. And clearly there's a lot to do, but really important that I'm able to prioritise and then um, sharing those with the executive team so that we can have a real, real clarity around what it is that we want to achieve uh, as an executive team and how we can organise ourselves and prioritise. But clearly, I'm coming into a very strong organisation and a very strong high performing executive team. So um, that's uh, that's an absolute bonus. So I'm going to hold it there and thank you all again for your really, really warm welcome. And I hand you over to David for his chief execs report. Thank you, David. Thank you, Julie. Um, thank you, Andy. Um, I mean, first of all, I'd like to uh, welcome you, Julie, into the organisation. Um, we're very pleased to be working with you. And I'd also like to uh, just thank the board um, and the executives for supporting me over the last uh, three months. Um, so, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, I mean, Julie, you've, you've touched on quite a few of the things in the report. So there's quite a lot in the report and there's quite a lot of linked documents as well in the reading room, just to give you a bit more background to some of the things we were doing. I mean, clearly Surrey Safe Care is, uh, it, we're at a momentous time with Surrey Safe Care. And I think uh, our thanks do go to, to Simon. I mean, you've, you've manhandled this fantastically across two organisations. Um, and um, it's 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 amazing that you're still not off with some kind of uh, uh, support needed. So uh, so I think you've done an absolutely brilliant job. We're all very excited about Surrey Safe Care. Um, as as we've described before, it's going to be a little bit bumpy, um, but it's um, it's it's such a fantastic step forward in in aligning our organisations in standardising and reducing variations. So it's so a brilliant work. Um, Julie, you've already touched on, on, on the finance. I mean, we finished the end of last year very strongly, uh, but the, there are huge challenges going forward. Um, and as, as identified in the report, um, you know, we have a gap at the moment, 
but what we're doing is we're all sitting down and we're, we're seeing how we close that gap um, as an organization but also with the system as well so there's a lot more movement that's going to take place there um, the, the, the main effort that, that, that Tom's been leading with the, the team and, and particularly Radcliffe um, and Jonathan in, in changing the narrative really around um, hospitals, that actually um, hospitals have got to be there to help people when, when we, uh, we can make a difference to, to their, their, their health and their outcomes. But actually admitting people when they don't need to admit it is, is often exposing patients to risk. And I think changing that narrative around that and it's and I think it's gained I think it's gained traction and I think um, concentrating on the criteria to admit and the reason to reside is is a really good way of um, aligning our teams that actually we've got to meet the needs of the patients and that patients do want to be at home they do not want to be an organisation they want to be at home with their loved ones and I think we are seeing um, some 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 good traction on that now. I mean, over the last couple of weeks, we've been in Opal 2, um, and um, that is when the rest of the system has been in, in Opal 4. Um, in the organisation today, we've got 53 empty beds at this moment. We're on Opal 2, 53 empty beds just at St Peter's and a number of beds um, uh, at Ashford as well. And that's unprecedented as, as well. And the discussion we had about that this is going to help drive and and reduce our bed base in the hospital. I think um, it does look as though that is the is the right way way forward. What we've got to do is make sure that we don't um, declare victory too quickly and take too much capacity out too quickly, because I think that will demoralise the teams and, and cause issues. So we just have to manage that in 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 the right way, and we need to look at that. Um, but I think I think that's been a brilliant piece of work, Tom. Actually, and I think also linking up with with the, with with Jack and and the, and the play space system, so that we align our efforts, so we're not duplicating the effort in the hospital and in the community, but actually there is a there is a defined role for each part of the system. Um, and and what we've seen is that you know our teams at the front door are working a different way. They're coordinating with the uh, the system in a better way, and the discharge process has 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 been better as well. There is still a long way to go, though. So there's still a lot more work to do, and there's still a lot more changes that that, that Tom's got uh, got in place. In terms of the um, elective centre, I mean, we spoke about this before, and we do know that there is a um, there's a there's a huge backlog in in elective cases within uh, within the NHS at, at present. And um, when we, um, you can see the detailed business case that we've submitted to the region regarding electricity. As you can see, we have split this into a number of phases. The first phase is really to make sure that we make best use of our current infrastructure and, and capacity. Um, we also need to, to, to um, relocate the expensive lease options that we have at, uh, at Ashford, including the theatres that are in the, uh, in the car park into the main building and then we need to see if we need to expand capacities further uh, going going forward and there is a lot of um, there's a lot of capacity in the system but it's probably not all in the right place uh, and it needs to be um, and we need to work out how we can deliver that in a more systematic way across the system so the first few phases are are underway at present um, we have appointed a project director uh, Claire and also a workforce transformation uh, person to work with Claire, because actually the workforce transformation that's going to be taking place in uh, in getting the infrastructure being utilised to its best ability is is one of the major components. Um, and there's a few things that we need to work out going forward into phase three, which we'll talk about later. Um, the maternity action plan. We're going to talk about maternity later on uh, in in the meeting, but the the action plan is in the reading room for everyone to look at. Um, in, in more detail. And I suppose the most important programme, and there's a very extensive um, plan on the on the people plan um, in the in the report as well. Um, and I think you know everything that we're doing is working with people and and our people, our staff, the community and our patients have been through an enormous amount over the last couple of years. And I think this 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 programme just set out all the bits of work that we are doing in that area. 
I'm really pleased that we've we've added to that improving people practices. I think that's a really important step that's going to go forward. Now, as you can see, with all these programs, we have tried to define some uh, uh, key performance indicators so we monitor the impact. Uh, and as Julie says, we're going to carry on these programs for the next few months while Julie uh, understands the organization and, and people and then adds her own flavor, flavor to them. So I'll just pause there for that uh, and I'll take any questions if. Uh, any questions for David? I think you're all clear to go, David. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so the, the next bit just shows the, the risks. And as you can see, um, when we triangulate our risks, there is a number of risks in, in most of the, the, the areas. And I think they do align with those pieces of work that we are doing. Um, they're all centered around uh, looking after people, but actually we've got the emerging risks about the um, performance and, um, and, and the finances within the system. There is still a, miss, a bit of misalignment between the KPIs and, and the triangulation of the risks, and that's what we've got to work on. We've got to start making sure that our key performance indicators are measuring the things that, that determine our risk. So I think there is a bit of work there to still do. Right, and in the um, in the in the next piece, there's just a few things. I mean, uh, Andy, you mentioned the um, the Eternal Garden, which was a, which was a great event, and and I think our thanks go to the um, Healing Arts team. Uh, which, which Andrew's involved in, but also Marcin, who's, um, who's driven this with, with passion and, um, and, and drive, um, and, and the results that she's achieved have been absolutely amazing. So I think if people haven't seen the Eternal Garden, it is well worth going to have a look at it. It's quite a remarkable, uh, remarkable piece. Uh, and on the back of that, um, Marcin is, is, is getting us to do a similar garden for the staff, which I think will be really well received. And she tells me she's got a few giant trees all ready to put in it, so the cost will be very low, so she says. Um, the, um, the catering team, just mentioning the catering team, catering are kind of some superstars in our organisation at the moment. And um, they have been nominated, so Ben Spencer was asking for us to uh, put a team forward, and uh, who's our local MP, and uh, he, they've been nominated for a parliamentary award. It's quite a, an interesting nomination uh, because it doesn't really fulfil the the um, the categories that they have. But actually, we felt so strongly about how how the health and well-being of our staff and the work you've been doing, Karen, has been so important during COVID that we felt that this was a really important thing to put forward. So um, Louise and Karen have done a lot of work in 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 in, in submitting the uh, uh, the nomination. Um, I'd also like to just mention the, um, the, 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 the trust research. There are a couple of things in here. One is that we, we should be very proud of our R&D team. During, during COVID, we recruited and were involved in so many of the national studies, the trials that, that went on. And actually, many of our teams got awards from the NIHR, uh, which I presented. The other thing was that it was an absolutely brilliant day because actually the basic academic papers that we published during COVID are, are really impressive. I don't think there's many district hospitals which have pr produced such a caliber of uh, academic output. So it's a really lovely afternoon uh, to spend with them. In terms of the theatre charter, I think this is a really important step. What we've noticed um, with, the, with the people plan, with the cultural transformation plan and with this, um, I think we are getting some traction. We've noticed that um, uh, some of the whistleblowing that was going very frequently to the CQC has um, has paused. It's it's paused for a short time, but but um, but I think that's a good sign. This theatre charter it was actually developed within the team uh, between them, actually to work out how they're going to work in theatres uh, and how they should interact with each other. So I think it's a really important piece of work. Um, and I think I'll I'll finish there. There's a few other things in my report, but I'm really happy to. Uh, answer any questions. David, I'd just like to uh, go back to the Eternal Garden really and just say a huge thank you to the Friends of St Peter's yeah. because they provided the funding for yeah. the Eternal Garden just to put on record of the board's gratitude yeah. for that. And Tom and I were talking about 
the friends yesterday because this is their kind of swan song at St Peter's uh, and the need probably for the charity commission to have a have a little think about uh, how best we use volunteers um, and people who have a passion for fundraising that aren't on our staff or our non-executives or governors uh, going forward but um, I thought I, it was a fantastic gesture from the friends and, and I was really pleased to see them there and, and as you say it's it's a great environment so uh, so that's that's really good so any other qu questions for David I think the only thing I would say is that we probably need from a risk point of view um, to look again through modern healthcare at the finance risks uh, as as the uh, current negotiations and discussions with ICB and the centre play out. Um, we, we may want to come and revisit that. It's not 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 the right thing to do at the moment. Everything's still in draft. You know, nothing is decided, um, but clearly uh, it does have an impact. So, so I yes. think um, Merrick and John, as as uh, Merrick's successor, uh, just have a think about that as as we go through. Yes, of uh, okay, David. So just just to say, uh, you know, uh, again on behalf of the board, a big thank you for leading the organisation for the last three months um, and for leading it with passion. Um, you could have just kind of said, well, I'll just do a holding operation, but actually you took on some really meaty things uh, that are coming through uh, and things that really mean a lot to the organisation and our patients. So I just wanted to say, say a real thank you to you for doing that. Um, it would have been just so easy to do a oh well I'll I'll just hold the ship but you, you've done far far more than that and uh, I know you've done it with great passion and uh, dedication so thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, um, so we're going to move on now then to the quality and safety section, uh, and we'll start off with the quality report. Um, I'm going to ask Jane for any uh, comments from a non-executive quality committee point of view before we uh, hand over to Andrea. Thank you. Um, we ha uh, had a meeting last week uh, where um, we, we focused on some of the key areas for improvement. So I think the things just to highlight is we recognise that some of the areas where we need to continue our focus is around falls and pressure damage. Um, the issues around antibiotic prescribing, where there was an audit that revealed that we needed to tighten our indications for prescribing of antibiotics. So there was a key focus on that. Uh, and some uh, further data on the surgical site infection rates, which um, there's, there's some back work being done on that. Um, some issues around complaints performance, which isn't as it as it should be still. And um, we have had some assurance at committee that this was due to sickness within the team. And actually, the figures and uh, uh, performance have in fact improved for April. So that was good to hear. Um, we are really pleased uh, with all the work in the healing arts, as you've just described, um, David. And I think uh, really positive from a patient experience and also staff experience point of view so that was really positive to see uh, the health in uh, works uh, the healing the, uh, i'll need to get the term right health in work healing anyway the pictures that they have in areas uh, where people are waiting to look at uh, uh, that are moving scenes uh, um, such, uh, nature scenes have been so popular they've really improved the environment when patients are waiting to be seen so we're looking where uh, working with Marcine and the team to see where they can be used and recently she looked at maternity to see where that healing arts could actually be used to improve the environment there so that's really positive um, and I'm going to hand over now to Andrea um, we recognize that, that you know there's a lot of hard work but we do keep our focus on the areas where we feel there needs to be improvements at the committee Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Andrea. <clears throat> Thank you, Jane. Um, so, uh, well, good morning. Firstly, good morning, everybody. And I'd just like to say happy International Nurses Day because it's Nurses Day today. So, uh, 
Um, so going on to the quality report, it's uh, this it's in its new format as well. This is the second edition of the new format. So again, we're sort of it's an iterative process, but you know, um, I think we've had some good feedback um, on the format of it, and obviously we'll tweak as as we go on with regards to this. So so I think Jane has picked up some of the the, the sort of the key points. I suppose it only covers March the the report, um, but it it does show a bit of a mixed picture. Um, with regards to our quality of priorities and how we were doing against that with uh, in March. And I think it's, again, sort of reflective of the operational pressures that we were seeing, um, but at that time. So just going to the, uh, with regards to patient experience and, and complaints, um, you will see that our performance around that really had dipped. It is down to six in the team. We've put some extra resource in in April to to help the team with that. Uh, and also we've got additional resource that's gone in for this month too. And I, I'm glad to say that the actual performance for April has risen to 85.7%. So that's really good. So we'll see that improving and get back above the 90% that we were seeing be before. I've already mentioned about the healing arts and I just like to say the eternal garden is getting so much use actually it's really really lovely to see um, and the comments that that patients and families are, are uh, providing in the book that we've got in the garden room that's there uh, are, are, are lovely so again as, as Andy said please do go and visit when you do have uh, time to to do so but a uh, really positive reaction to it instantly which is wonderful um, medication safety, I think that's been a real success story for us and I think it's one of our quality priorities. Year on year we have met, through the safety programme we've had, we've met the target and it's great to see at the end of this year that we we did uh, for, for that, uh, which is wonderful to see and we still uh, want to um, improve clearly going forward on that. We, we're a bit cognizant with the introduction of uh, Surrey Safe Care that we probably will see an increase in uh, medication uh, incidents going up only because at the moment it's down to two obviously individuals humans noting if there's been a medication error but with an electronic system it will clearly identify straight away if there's been a missed dose for instance um so we'll obviously monitor that as we go through but that's a good thing um but uh, but but great work that's been done around that and from an ipc perspective i suppose this is a little bit of a mixed picture i mean covid clearly um it's illustrated in the report the pressures from covid you know we had hospital acquired uh covid we had outbreaks happening within the organization and it's due to the fact the number of covid inpatients that we were were treating was was quite significant good to see that in april now that's all started to come down we've had um Golly, it's been weeks since we've had uh, hospital acquired COVID, which is brilliant. No outbreaks reported. And as David said, we've only got six um, COVID positive patients in the organisation. The great news within within IPC is the wonderful work and the achievements that have been um, uh, that we've seen around bacteremias. Um, we've met all, nearly all of our targets around bacteremias, which in previous years we hadn't done. Um, and so, and again, I think that's down to the, obviously the, the strict IPC measures that we've had in place. And obviously, we're very keen to continue that great practice. But also with uh, C diff as well, we're one of the best um, uh, acute hospitals uh, nationally with regards to our targets around that. Uh, what, what we have achieved with our numbers. So that's brilliant, brilliant um, to, to see. The antimicrobial guardianship, we are due for a re-audit actually uh, in September. So um, Jane's absolutely right. Uh, there's been an action plan wrapped around it for when it was last audited last year. The re-audit, hopefully we'll see those, those improvements, but that work still continues. And with regards to SSIs, you'll notice in the report, it's, it's actually knee replacement SSIs that sort of are flagging uh, as as a concern, um, but these are actual actual in the main superficial infections. But there's an improvement pathway wrapped up, wrapped around that, and lots of work ongoing to to reduce them. Happy to take any questions on that. And as Jane says, with the harms, we uh, again it's been a bit of a mixed picture in in uh, March with regards to pressure damage um, category two. We we met our target, but with category three we didn't. Falls, we we had seen a an increase in falls, both um, uh, uh, first falls and then repeated falls. Uh, I'm glad to say, again in April, we've seen a, a really improved picture uh, on that, particularly around falls. They've dramatically reduced, which is great. And obviously, to, um, and you going to to Swift Ward to congratulate them around that was um, as a Sam's Ward. That's that's absolutely brilliant. 
And then the last bit, I suppose, I'll just mention, which might uh, generate some questions, is about the obviously the deaths, mortality, and um, the the Rami for for March just showing increase. Um, it is considered that increase is due to to COVID. Um, and what you what you will see is um, our peers are start that that their increase is also starting to to project up as as well. Um, but but both David and I are happy to take any particular questions. On that, I think I'll leave it at that, Andy. Um, for now, and as I say, okay. have taken questions. Thank you, Thanks, Andrea. Jane. Thank you, um, thank you, Andrea. I, I think uh, maybe I could just ask David just to pick up on the Rami because it was an area we did raise at the committee prior, and it was an area that we have a bit more information. So, David, if you could talk to that, that'd be great. And the only other thing I, I meant to raise, apologies, I didn't raise it earlier, is that um, our new chief executive raised the issue around our stroke performance and actually it's not really visible in any of our reports so we are going to look at where we're going to frame that whether it will be the quality report or the performance report but it's something that we are going to be uh, making sure is visible uh, in future reports so just wanted to flag that thank you David thank you. maybe could I ask you yeah so <clears throat> I mean the RAMI is the risk adjusted mortality index so it links to the um um the illness of the patients and what the likelihood of a bad outcome is. And as you can see, our rates started going up earlier than our peers. The peers have now started going up. Interestingly, the standardised hospital mortality index, which is the which is the system figure, um, and that's that's reported that's reported six months in arrears, so um, or three months in arrears. So we've only got the figures up to December, and that is absolutely very low. So that's 0.92, which is which is possibly the lowest that I've seen in the in the organization but that is before we've seen this this um, this uh, this this rise um, I, I'm not sure we're entirely certain why we're seeing this rise at the moment we've asked Paul and we've asked the medical examiner's officer to start looking through the deaths to see if there's any themes that are coming through um, we did have quite a lot of um, patients who um, remained in the organization with palliative care but actually, in, in, the, in the risk adjusted mortality index, those are kind of taken out of the system a little bit. So, um, so we're not quite sure why those why there has been that increase. But we, we've got some work going on through the medical examiner's officer, through our review of death and structured judgment reviews, and through Paul and his work. Thank you, David. Thanks, thanks, David. James. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Andrew, I just had a, a couple of questions. Well, my first one was about the friends and family test, um, because the performance is what the re, the response rate overall was. It's I can't remember now, six point one or six point seven percent. When when it gets to that point, you kind of ask, is it is it in any way representative, um, or worth doing? I, there's something in there about text being turned off um, because of a problem with it. Is there anything that we should be doing about? improving that rate so so first i'd like to say this <clears throat> that you're right it's 6.7 was uh, stated for march it's the that's that's been the best response rate that we've seen ever <laughs> just going to repeat that ever so um <laughs> but we've got an ambition to get to 20 percent um and and it's 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 you know it's quite a big ambition but uh but we really do want to get to that um and so there's a quality improvement program wrapped around it and you are right the the service was switched off the air the texting service was switched off for a period of six weeks actually which just did cover the end of um uh march and into into april so unfortunately it will affect our result for for april actually uh, and that was due to the fact that that um unfortunately texts were being sent to to patients who had suddenly passed away and so we we had to jump on that and and you know put a control in to stop it and it, in order to do that the system had to go down the text messaging system had to go down but it was a period of six weeks unfortunately but that's been resolved now thankfully um but there is a yes there is a qi program wrapped around it to get to the 20 percent i'm chairing that 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 meeting now and um uh I mean, we've just we've just paused the program at the moment because of Surrey Safe Care, but then we'll reinvigorate it once we've we've popped out of that. So in the next few weeks. Ooh, Jane. Okay, David. Well, I, I think I think uh, Andrew said it all, but um, but it's quite right, James, that if 
If we think patient experience is the most important factor that drives improvement methodology, then we do need to uh, we do need to increase that rate. But part of it is, I mean, what what me and Andrea found is part of it is, you know, we we need to we need to make the case with the staff as well as how important this is because it's it's one of the first things that gets kind of dropped off the to do list when when people are busy. And I think we just got to we've got to turn that round. It's there's a similar story I think about staff feedback as well that we. We, you know, the PCON survey and things like that, we do need to encourage people and make the argument that, that those are the ways that we can drive drive improvement in a in a kind of in a, or get get feedback in a more immediate way and then take action. So so I think I think there's a cultural piece around this as well, James, that we need to we need to put in. We have actually, just to add on to that, David, we have brought it into our ward accreditation process as a, a part of it's, you know, it has scrutiny and looked at as well, which, which is really good. But we do have areas that are exemplars around this. Swift Ward is one, for instance. You know, they're really, really good on making sure every patient gets, um, does do the feedback. So, you know, there's, there's great stuff that we can pull on from, from these particular wards for the others to, to take on board. And it's like everything else, isn't it, that I saw at Swift yesterday. It's about leadership yeah. and, and teamwork, you know. And, and <laughs> Absolutely. If you've got the right enthusiastic leader, um, these things are infectious. They are. Yeah. And James is quite right. Six percent isn't representative, of course, or statistically significant. But I think we've been down at two percent, haven't we? Oh, my. Yes, I'm way below that. <laughs> So, so, you know, we have, we are making improvements. We've got a long way to go, uh, I think. And, and David makes a really good point about these staff surveys as well. Uh, I think that's, yeah, I think generally people will do these things if they think they're having an impact, if they think they're filling stuff in and nobody does anything about it. So it's the feedback on them, the feedback loop that really matters. You know, we heard this and we've done this. Um, just going back to the stroke, have we because we used to get the uh, the grading of the HAZU, didn't we? Uh, every every quality committee and it was, you know, whatever. I forgot what it was A to D or, or whatever it was or one to five. I can't remember now. Um, did we lose that somewhere along the way then? Well, it, when we were reporting against that, David, um, Andy, it was um, it was set as a quality priority for that year. And as a consequence of that, as we do in the quality report, we always report against that. Hmm. Um, but of course, we we dropped that off when we were reaching A's, when we were getting that sort of performance set consistently, an A. Um, but it, it obviously things have deteriorated slightly, understandably, but um, that we need to pick that up. It's whether or not it's in the performance report. I mean, it's not a quality priority for us this year. So, um, I think the, the discussion we did think maybe to get it into the performance report for the time but anyway happy to I discuss think, i think we do need it in the report so uh i'll take james and then julie yeah and uh, i think it's important it's visible I, I don't mind where but i think one of the things that we've been really challenged with and we we need to make sure we're visible on is is flow when we we've in all of my reports through the last 18 months We've talked about the challenge of red and green pathways with COVID and non-COVID beds, of of all the challenges that's been in the system. And that has given a challenge around stroke, where we have had to yeah. divide up the organisation in ways that we've never had to before between people we we know have got COVID, between people that we know haven't, between people who have been exposed to it, and that has created us a real challenge. We're in a position now, as colleagues have alluded to so far in their papers, that. We have get we're getting some space back in the organization the number of COVID has come down and that is really enabling us to make a focus on this so regardless of where it's reported the work is going on to make sure that these patients are getting through the right pathways and being seen in the right way and time frames okay yeah thank you james um julie Thank you. And and James has probably just made reference to the, the, the thing that I was going to highlight. The reason that I was so aware of it was because in um, my previous trust, our SNAP stroke rating had dropped from an A to a C to a D, primarily because of the COVID red and green pathways on the emergency side of, of um, stroke management. So we'd really, really struggled. Um, what I used to do is, uh, as the Chief Operating Officer at Eastern North Hearts, I'd include it in the performance report, but would highlight quality aspects around stroke to the Quality and Safety Committee. So happy to have an offline conversation with James and Andrew about how we present it, but um, just for assurance, we'll make sure it is captured and then pull out the right aspects for the relevant um, sub board committee. So thank you. 
Yeah, and I think stroke is important because it's one of those things that pre ICS was kind of done not completely, shall we say, at a system level, because the the plan and we we had the Hazu was you know. Uh, was not because of various pressures was then diluted. So I think stroke is one of those things that we need to look at again as a provider collaborative to make sure that the resources are in the right place, are in the hazards, um, and that you know other other places kind of you know may have to lose some uh, resources in order to make sure that the places that are have the hazards are properly resourced but i think it's one it is one for the provider collaborative julie if you could uh, put that on your list um which i know is a, an ever growing one but okay so any other questions on anything on the quality report please for uh, for andrea or indeed david okay i think i think that's right so in which case Let's move on to the maternity report. Um, but Jane, do you want to lead off on this one? Yes, um, just a little bit of background for board. Um, I did a, a safety walk around as in my role as maternity safety champion on the uh, in, in March um, the 29th. And I had a number of areas of concern that were raised uh, around the workforce, around the, the environment of care. Um, that staff raised with me uh, around uh, student supervision, which I raised uh, really quickly with the chairman and the executive team, uh, pleased to say that this was heard and actions were taken very swiftly. Uh, support was put into to the division um, to address some of the areas of concern that had been raised. Uh, we had a board uh, meeting, uh, a board call on the 8th of April, uh, and I had an extraordinary uh, quality of care meeting on the 25th, where we specifically looked at the key actions just to be assured that anything that we could immediately do had been done and that we had a plan around the longer term actions, which obviously uh, the report will, will highlight some of those, but not all of them because this is a more general report. But just to say that um, together with this work, we also have maternity safety meetings, which the chief nurse and I attend with the senior team within maternity, which looks at the overall demands, because with 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 Ockerden, the national reports um, and there are some national reporting frameworks which we have to do around um, around claims and, uh, and around assurance uh, around safe practice for maternity services and neonatal services. It is really important <laughs> those and that we can carry tight rein on those. So just to say that's been a lot of work and I really do commend the teams that have been working very hard and the division because they've been working very hard. There is further work to do. One of the areas that I highlighted a little bit earlier was around some staff do still feel that they are not aware of the actions we've taken. So that's some work we need to do to highlight and communicate a bit more clearly exactly what we've done to date and what we're planning to do to support them. Um, just, I think, finally to say that we're not alone in this. This is a regional and, in fact, national uh, challenge. Um, there is a national shortage of midwives. There are key workforce pressures. Um, and this is something that both myself and the chief nurse have been aware of on regional and national calls. Um, so we, we, we are not seen as a particular area of concern, but we are seen as an area where our culture is open and that we've been honest about our challenges. I think that's important. Um, that, and it does show the, the floor to board assurance uh, in that, you know, I was on the floor, I heard it and it was immediately escalated and we've immediately put in some support. I have to say we need to continue that and we will need to keep our eyes on it. However, I, I, I'm pleased to say that this is this is this open and honest and that's really important as a board. So um, I'll, I'll move on to the division now to, uh, to obviously, uh, or I, I'm not sure, Andrew, are you presenting the report or is, is James? Um, the team are here actually, but I'll just do a little intro. So thank you, thank you, Jane. Um, that, that was a great overview. And um, so the the team are the maternity team, senior leadership team are here to to present um, their their report this morning. Um, again, just to illustrate that the the, the ward to to board um, process. But they're going to give an update on obviously Ockerden, 
requirements and our actions are get against those. Also, the more can bay um, uh, report as well and uh, our progress against those. Uh, and obviously, we can do uh, an update on, on clearly on the action plan, as you said, uh, of the issues that were, that were raised um, at the back end of, of, of March, uh, James. So thank you. So without further ado, James, Emma, you want to? Thank you, Andrea, oh, and thank, thank you very you. much, Jane, and, and a big thank you to the whole team, really, because um, if, it, if it wasn't for um, you having raised those concerns up and, and the exec team for having taken them and, and supported us in moving forward, we, we wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be in, in, in this position. So uh, really grateful for that openness and, and, and helping us get there. Um, we have had a lot of uh, pressures over the um, uh, last few months. Uh, and they've, uh, as, as you rightly say, the, the midwifery workforce is a big, big issue that's national uh, as opposed to just local. Um, and uh, looking at the looking through the paper, uh, workforce was our number one, uh, number one issue concern. Um, we've got uh, the work that's going on for midwifery recruitment. Um, HCIB also published a couple of uh, draft reports that referenced the impact of staffing shortages on the delivery of care. Uh, and um, we've also uh, had uh, assessment of our obstetric medical workforce as well to try and make sure that we can embed these this learning within the medical side and work more as a multidisciplinary team. As far as the junior workforce goes as well, we're assessing that to make sure we have the right backup uh, but as, as you say, the main pressure point is within midwifery staffing. The other thing that was brought up was about estates and 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 the and the environment that we work in. We've been working closely with Tom and the team and had a work round walk around with Andy Grimes, Andrew Grimes, to look at potential solutions and how we can uh, how we can improve the environment safely because a lot of the concerns that we've had about how can we improve the theatre complex, how can we improve the labour ward, yet not run into any further risks, have always met a bit of a dead end. So actually we're just waiting on a structural engineer's report, which hopefully um, will give us the go ahead for uh, what appears and a very positive plan. So I've got fingers crossed on that structural engineer's report on the roof um, for that. So hopefully that um, that comes through in the near future and then we'll be able to progress some of the estates work uh, more easily um, and then I'm sure with 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 projects like that and and, and staff um, and the public seeing those move forward they will actually find they will actually see feel more positive about things as well when they see actions are actually happening and things are getting done so hopefully that will be a really positive step forward um, from an estates perspective from an Ockenden side, um, there was obviously the immediate back in December 2020, there were the seven immediate um, actions to take and we, we got a couple of those in very, very quickly. Um, there was the, uh, so this is Appendix 1. Um, the two that we got in very quickly were the monitoring fetal well-being. Uh, we got a substantive fetal well-being midwife uh, in post who does regular sessions and is vital in our in the improvement of care. We're embedding um, the, or we have embedded, the fetal physiology uh, way of reviewing CTGs, which is much more intuitive and it's much more scientific than the NICE way and um, staff training and working together. So we've got um, multidisciplinary training and uh, twice uh, twice daily, seven day a week, um, multidisciplinary, but consultant led ward rounds um, that are implemented. Uh, we do have to work on enhancing safety. That's a con continuous um, improvement. We have a complex care continuity team and uh, requires ongoing audit, but I, I think we can probably put that as verging on green at the moment. There's a couple of areas that we still need to work on. Um, listening to women and their families is obviously an on ongoing uh, piece of work and um, we're working hard in different communities to to help with that and risk assessment throughout pregnancy is um, reliant on Badgernet and Badgernet has a lot of touch points throughout the antenatal process that 
we can put those risk assessments on, but it's not embedded in all of those areas. So that's something that we need CleverMed to actually implement for all of those different things to be able to confirm with that. Moving on to the concerns that were raised to Jane, um, there are very comprehensive um, set of concerns and they do reflect our ongoing um, plans anyway. So are you okay if I share the screen for that? Would that be helpful or not? Um, yep, you can do that, James. Yep. Thanks. Okay. That would be... Just making sure I don't share my emails by accident. There we go. Um, so again, the first one that was raised was uh, midwifery and safer staffing, oversight and planning. And um, we've got uh, the data being provided regularly by Chris Nelson. So we've got an idea of how much work we've got coming up, how much elective work, um, and then potentially how much emergency work we've got coming up. So how many women will be approaching term. Uh, so we've got, we've got an idea of, of where we're at and what we're facing. Uh, we were reviewing the non midwifery roles that could be supported through other places. So this is Ellen's uh, safe care team uh, and we're looking to we've actually for, appointed the service manager and they have started now as uh, so they're just getting into their role. And again, um, we're looking for help with uh, essentially the admin side of getting the ERFs out and through. Uh, so hopefully that will improve it gradually over time. Um, we've got an additional staffing template with extra bank uh, from different uh, different team members, and as we mentioned before, the safe care teams in place. So we've had we've had quite a lot of immediate actions there, but the longer term action is to improve recruitment and improve retention, and we do that in a range of ways um, and helping staff to uh, enhance their enhance their skills um, and uh, enhance their roles as well. Um, we've had um, some extra help with RotorGeek, uh, which has been useful, especially over these last couple of weeks. And a big thank you to the team for getting that up and, and, and having oversight of those those rotors as well. Um, because for the go live for Surrey Safe Care, we've had to have a much greater scrutiny of the staff we've got on the ground. Um, as far as the transformation lead support, um, that's meant to start uh, very shortly. And as far as the Ockenden recommendations, um, we're, we've got a working group, um, we'll start working groups to get the assessments and the RAG rating done for them. So the medium to long term uh, plan, there's, there's quite a lot that's to be done still. Uh, we are working really hard to recruit to different midwifery support vacancies, uh, midwifery posts, and uh, to get some of the um, funding agreed. Uh, we, we've got a birth rate plus review going through as well, um, and that will include the band seven supernumerary uh, uh, manager on call uh, shift coordinators to allow that helicopter view um, so that the um, the staff on the ward can work clinically and allow them to. Uh, to have better oversight. From a medical. Um, staff, we're. We're looking to do a full service review to make sure that we have full embedded cover um, rather than trying to. Uh, provide cover within outside of people's job plans and it, it just makes it a lot more more fluid and, and allows all the services to run effectively together. So one doesn't suffer. For the other one, um, and as mentioned before, we've got to uh, get the middle grade. Side sorted. To be fair, some of this has been slightly delayed by Surrey Safe Care because our um, focus has been elsewhere, but um, we'll get straight back on it once that's embedded. Um, we do have a couple of new registrars starting, which is good, and we've sorted and increased the SHO numbers, and that was in response to the GMC survey and, and uh, concerns raised there. Um, midwifery students, again, Jane brought quite rightly brought that up. There were concerns uh, that mid, uh, midwifery students were being left on their own unsupervised uh, or at least they felt they were unsupervised and in some cases I'm sure had been um, and we have made sure that they are supernumerary and are not to be used in that way so people are very aware 
of not leaving students unsupervised or unsupported. Um, we are trying as hard as we can to ensure that all mandatory training is kept running. Um, prompt will be delayed for this month because of the Surrey Safe Care rollout, but we'll carry on throughout uh, throughout the rest of the year. And pastoral support with staff, um, Lawrence has offered and Karen and Louise and the team have been very helpful in improving some of those. Um, and as I mentioned before, ongoing career development and training uh, is, is a key, key part of retention of staff. Leadership support. The presence of the exec team going around has been absolutely great. The staff, when they see the exec team, non-execs and Jane coming around, are, they feel much more valued um, and they feel much more seen and recognised for their work. So that's really important and a massive thank you to all you guys for doing that. Um, and the, from an IT perspective, again, Badgernet and Cerner don't talk together, but we having, um, I think we've come to that final realisation. So we're working with the two systems side by side. We've, from an operational perspective, I think we're almost to the end soon. But then you be able to have a break from my voice. Um, from an operational perspective, uh, we've uh, been working on the um, Opal 4 pathway so that when we do need Opal 4, it can be a much smoother uh, and intuitive way of uh, getting through things. And the ABC, I'm pleased, uh, has been open more often um, as staffing has got better. We've had less COVID absence recently and that has improved the staffing. So we've been able to open the birth centre uh, more frequently, but it is an ongoing concern that that's one of the areas that will get shut first. That does reduce women's choice. It does reduce the um, the job satisfaction from the midwives as well, who want to maintain and promote normality and provide care in that environment. And it is a, from a maternity midwifery perspective, it is a flagship um, centre in the south, in, in the uh, in in the ICS. So we're really keen to use that and, and use that to our advantage. Estates, as I mentioned before, we've uh, made some progress on that. Um, we're just waiting for the uh, the uh, structural survey report. And from the governance, um, I had a we had an email through from Lisa Williams yesterday. I think it was yesterday, um, saying that she they've done an audit of the safety checks, which was one of the important things that was raised. Um, and month before last, it was at 60, 65 percent of all safety checks were done. And the last month, it's been 94 to 96 percent. So the teams were put a massive amount of effort into that to improve the safety checks on the equipment, making sure all stuff is uh, available. So a really good, um, good improvement there. Theatre transfer issue was sorted and the equipment is being dealt with. Um, this is a much longer piece of work, this last one here. Um, and we're continually working on QI and, and governance. Thank you for the time. Thanks, James. If you could stop sharing the screen, that'd be great. I will do it straight away. There we go. Lovely. Thank so, you. Emma. Um, I'm not sure if you want me to go first. I just want to touch on a couple of things specifically for Ockenden that do need to be um, voiced, at, voiced aboard, if that's OK, unless people want to ask questions around what James has asked already. I think let's let's do this one and then we'll go into questions. OK, um, so we are required to um, off the back of the Ockenden uh, final report, we've been asked to state our position in terms of safe staffing and whether or not we are able to continue with the continuity of care provision that we are already providing. There are three options within that that were detailed in the paper. Um, we are going to go with option three, which would be to suspend our continuity of care provision. We've um, calculated what this means for our women and for our midwives um, and it's going to release around six whole time equivalent back to the inpatient and community rosters. Um, we're just um, doing a sort of an informal consultation with staff around this and giving them various options for where 
they would like to work and then we'd, and we've reviewed the pathways of where the women would then feed into. What we are maintaining though is our care um, provision for enhanced provision for some of our women with complex care needs and some of our women with vul uh, our vulnerable women with additional um, uh, safeguarding needs. So we're just going through that with staff now. At the same time as having to consider how we suspend continuity, we are also being required to submit our plans for how we will roll continuity out 100%. Um, so we're just asking the regional team for an extension. So the deadline is 15th of June, but that does require the plans to go through um, our internal governance and um, trust board um, meetings as well. Um, which we aren't able to. We're just waiting on our birth rate plus, which will inform those decisions. Um, so we're just asking for an extension. Um, so that's that's that. And then just briefly on Morecambe Bay, um, just so that it's 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 captured here. Um, a lot of the actions here are superseded by the original Ockenden recommendations and the new ones. I just wanted just to pull out a couple of things from there. Um, one of which is our risk assessment, which James has already kindly covered. Um, that sits as an amber. Um, we are required to provide high dependency training, um, which we currently um, don't have full provision across our, um, our high risk areas. Um, and that is also in the, in the um, new Ockenden recommendations. So we'll be looking to support that um, as a priority. Um, the estates piece, again, James has covered, that sits as, as a, an outstanding as part of Morecambe Bay. Um, and just to mention around the duty of candour, um, just that's captured here, what we have embedded that process here, but what we do have is a number of backlog reports. So we did a large piece of work on last year. Um, they, we are required to, um, sh we are in a position to share those with the families. We just need some, um, again, it's been capacity around admin to support to get that right for us. Um, so it's just to say that we do have those um, reports. There's around 26 of them outstanding that we will be sharing with the families in due course. We just need to clarify the time frame on that. OK, thank you, Emma. We've got a veritable forest of hands here, so uh, I'm not sure if they're for you or for or for James, but um, we'll take David first. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very quick question, actually, probably to Simon. It's just about that um, that worrying that, that worrying um, bit of information about Baginet and Cerner and, and the separation between the two. So it was just asking from Simon is that you know, is that going to be a permanent fixture or is there a timeline when that will be joined up? Because that would would not be helpful going forward, really. Uh, I mean, there is separation between the two, there, um, but it's only in certain areas, David. It's not across the board. Right. So, um, and we can continue to work on that and try and make it seamless and so that you uh, can log across from one straight into the other. Um, it's not quite on the immediate priority list, given everything else that's going on, but it's certainly on a list somewhere, and I can review exactly how far up it is. I suppose it's it's flagging as a risk, isn't it? So, um, so we need to understand how big. Yeah, a risk it's it's. Um, I mean, I would view it as mitigated, but I mean, it's down to the team really um, to comment on the appropriateness of that. Um, I, I, we will pick it up post go live and I'll find out exactly you know once we've prioritized it to understand you know how far down the line that is David at the moment I don't know okay. yeah. I'll look into it for you though. we did pick that up Simon very early on in the digital committee that there needed to be an API between the two um yeah yeah it's um it's 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 an existing risk in many ways um you know across our across our systems um and that I mean all systems will be seamlessly integrated at some point in future. Uh, that, that's our aim. Uh, that's what I can say to you today. Uh, it's just trying to confirm the when exactly that will be in place is difficult. And I think the other thing that I would say on the digital side is we, we shouldn't hesitate to use the national team to kind of put pressure on companies if they're if they're being recalcitrant about this because Baginet is all over the place, as is Cerner. Um, yeah. So, you know, People like the CTO, David Turner, for the national thing. We we should use his good officers if we need to. Obviously, not not if we don't need to. But sorry, Andrea. 
Um, th thanks, Andy. So my points were actually around continuity of care and actually just bringing up the Morkin base. Thanks, Emma, you've you've picked those up. So that, that, that well done. Um, and I think the only other bit really was asked around that our, our CNST really, isn't it? And our, our clinical negligence sort of scheme. Um, and we're not alone here. All acute trusts are in the same boat. But, um, you know, meeting some of those particular standards is going to be challenging due to the workforce challenges everyone's facing. Uh, I think we just need to face a little bit of the reality on, on that. But I think, um, you know, well done, on, you know, from your perspective. I just want you to say a huge well done from the senior leadership team. You, you guys have done a lot of work uh, around this. It has been very challenging, hasn't it, with um, with the, the staffing levels and, and the complexity of cases that have come in as well, I think. Um, but you, you guys have, you know, you really have handled it inc incredibly well. So, um, yeah, well, well done. Thank you. And we're not alone. It's this is all maternity mm. services, or it's really important to note that are experiencing the same challenges as well. Yeah. I think that speaks to the challenge from a system point of view, which we should, you know, not hesitate to lead to say, are there better ways of doing as a system, better ways of utilising our, our our resources, our staff, you know, our our estates. You know, I, I don't think we should take anything off the table at this point, but uh, just look at it from a system perspective. I think that's really important. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, no, I agree with that, um, Andy. Um, Baroness Cumberledge and I, and Baroness Cumberledge is quite an expert in this space, um, speaks <laughs> nationally in it. Um, James, we did a bit of work on student midwives and what was happening to them. And we were both pretty shocked and surprised how many of them didn't want to stay in the NHS culture and their early experience of it. And I just wondered, and particularly their experience of engaging with other mid, more senior midwives who found them all a bit of a chore. So it was just interesting to listen more widely, not in Ashford and St Peter's, about what the experience was. So I just wondered what um, work you do with your present midwives in terms of training with regard to um, how they um, work with students and new midwives because this is their first introduction to an NHS culture so there was that question. The other question I'm aware of that some of these very bright young women in my experience having talked to them come with really interesting innovative ideas actually which some of them found weren't taken seriously not that they've sort of going to solve the world I'm sure but actually, innovation in these spaces is really, really important. And this new generation, who are very tech savvy, of course, um, also do come with potentially quite important insights about the future. So I just wondered on those two points, um, James, um, how you were dealing with that. And just thirdly, whether you have any relationship with the independent w midwives, um, because having myself met a number of those, I found them massively impressive people. Um, but um, yeah, I just wonder what your experience was of all of that. I think that, that, that question is probably better aimed at Emma and Gemma. OK. <laughs> um, so in terms of student midwives, I think it is a, it is a really um, challenging forum for them at the minute. I think the, the need to train more midwives and have ever increasing numbers of students is brilliant because we need the workforce at the end of that but then being able to provide them with the right supports and training and supervision and um well-being support through their through their training is challenging when you have workforce issues with the new midwifery workforce i think that goes across the board and student retention is certainly something we've been talking about with our local universities and looking at how we can improve that and, and a good example through the pandemic is that we started with a cohort of around 25 student midwives there are 11 of them qualifying now and, yeah. and most of their training has been through the pandemic and that that is challenging yeah. so I think, um there's a lot more work to be done around student midwives and um, certainly what we try to do is um on board and support as much as possible and, and particularly for our newly qualified midwives we've got a comprehensive receptorship package we are um we've tried various things around um buddying as a head of midwifery i have a session with them every month and um, where they can meet with me but we have an open door policy okay. Um, and I'd like to introduce the same for student midwives, actually, that we just have a drop in coffee and a chat session with us as senior leadership team for the student midwives. And, and we need to look at that as well. They do bring great innovation. And I think at the Pride of Nursing Midwifery Day, it's really
really lovely to look at some of our midwives who qualified in the last couple of years presenting some of the innovation they brought to the trust like biomechanics and um, the work they're doing in the birth center the use of aromatherapy <coughs> etc um, and the complex care team and the care they're giving as part of that um, new models of working so we're really always very keen to hear from our students our newly qualified midwives because they've often got far better and new ideas than we have who've been in the NHS for quite a long time you know we all do get a bit entrenched in that mm. um, and so I think um, I think midwifery retention as a whole at the minute is challenging from students right through to experienced midwives senior midwives I think it, it, it is a reasonably difficult place to be currently and we need to change that narrative and I know there's some national work going to go on around that as well I think mm -hmm. if we could have more positive media reporting um, it would be brilliant. Um, Demi, I can see you put around coaching and I think that's a really important aspect of, of culture is that we have coaching and we have good support in place. Thank you. Thanks. Great to see you, Gemma, by the way. Um, and I think, you know, it is really important that we get that positive feeling out there that, you know, midwives are listened to, that, you know, their ideas are, are taken up. Uh, that we look after them from a well-being point of view, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and yes, it is difficult. And yes, we haven't got enough. Um, but again, the kind of backfilling uh, of people who don't need to be midwives uh, with, uh, with other uh, professions uh, has to be good as well. Um, we do try and just to assure when our student midwives join us in their very first year, we, we do try and make them feel that they are as much part of the team as our midwives who are qualified and working here. So when we talk about the team, we are talking about our student midwives as well. Mm -hmm. Staff Facebook group, we encourage them to join and be a part of and we invite them to all our events. Yeah, OK, great. Um, Julie. <clears throat> Thank you, Andy, and uh, great to see you team, um, James and Gemma and Emma. Um, my question goes back to the system working and uh, I think James you made reference to the Ashford business the Ashford birthing centre ABC just trying to kind of get on top of all the local acronyms um, so if, if this is a bit of a jewel in the crown for us and the system but I think at times of staffing issues the risk is that it's closed and then there's a reduction in in patient choice I've got some nods so that's helpful and um, through the, the conversations that you're having at regional level with the LMNS, uh, are, are there opportunities thinking about provider collaboration across the maternity units? And I, and I don't underestimate how challenging this would be. Are there opportunities to sort of put um, the ABC forward as, as a bit of a kind of soft start around that provider collaboration, how we could create a cabal of midwives from across the system that, that worked on a sort of rotational basis on that unit to maintain its capacity from a system perspective would be my question. Um, I mean, I, from my perspective, yes, I definitely think there is an um, opportunity to be had. And I know for a long time, and it is it is challenging, isn't it, in system working about how we do, how do we deliver our maternity care across the system? We have in a relatively small geographical area got quite a few maternity services and how can we look to deliver our care differently and, and in a very collaborative way? I think we all always have to consider our geography of how far women will travel. Um, and be willing to travel um, but certainly keeping the Abbey Birth Centre open as much as possible is a priority and it and it is not our first line management it's kind of our pre needing to look at diversion management where we're having to consolidate into one intrapartum area so I think if there is any opportunity system wise we would absolutely look to try and um, work on that. And, and as you rightly say it might well be an easy easy way in to start that process. Um, and less threatening to other 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 units and places as well. Yes, that's what I was thinking. OK, I'll, I'll come and talk to you about it and see how we might be able to position that. Thank you. So, um, John. Oh, James, I'm a Gemma. I think it's fantastic to actually hear that um, report from you this morning. Actually, it's very heartening in terms of the actions that are being taken. Um, I've just been on a NED induction recently and certainly people from around the country were sort of sharing same issues around um, the problems that being shared there. One of the things that was discussed about was um, whether there was any opportunity for conversion of registered nurses to midwife and whether, whether that's happening. 
and, and obviously the time that's taken in that. But I understood that that can be an 18 month process. Are, are we pursuing that? Um, yes, yes, we are pursuing that. So um, we're doing well, we're doing a number of things. One is an international effort to recruit um, nurses with midwifery experience or nurses. Um, and we're doing a, both a regional and an in, a trust um, kind of effort on that. Um, the other thing is we are looking, we are advertising um, conversion courses as well and linking in with the university on that. We already have to support the midwifery shortfalls we do already have bank lines of work for nurses to support Lay Ward and Joan Book Award um, to provide some of those elements um, that don't have to be provided by a midwife and that's that's working well for us. We're just looking at um, providing some longer lines of work for some of those agency staff. Um, and we are, we're also looking at some permanent contracts and, and utilising our birth rate plus um, report to look at where we might permanently put some nursing staff as well. All right, OK. And Julie sort of beat me to the point in terms of the jewel in the crown, because I think it's those sort of things that we need to be putting out there mm -hmm. that then would be very attractive to people coming into work from a, you know, from a, a, a system wide perspective. I, th I think we've got two jewels in the crown, actually. I think we've got Abbey Birth Centre for facilitating um, lower risk birth and for women who are choosing to have care in their outside of guidance and that we facilitate that that personalisation and choice. I think our other jewel in the crown is that we've got a level three NICU and a labour ward that provides really complex labour care. And I don't think we should forget that. What I think probably lets that jewel in the crown down is the estate around it. And we need to, you know, we, we're working on that. But actually, as a service, we can offer everything right um, okay. women. Yeah. and we have you know i think yes the birth center is beautiful and it is a jewel in the crown i, I think we should also think of the level three NICU high dependency complex care service as a jewel in the crown as well okay and sorry my very last point it's quite a minor point but uh, we did hear a patient's story and she did sort of refer to this thing that it was quite I'm not off-putting, but she was a bit worried by going to a complex care continuity team. And I just wonder whether there's any opportunity just to change the name of that team. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a bit more. We did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we looked at the names for our community teams and we were picking um, famous women through history, actually, and we'd got a list of those. What hasn't happened is it's quite embedded it's with everything else. It's got on. <laughs> it hasn't caught on at all, so it wasn't right, called the okay. complex care team. It's actually got another name. Psychologically, it could become quite a big impact. Yes, yeah. no, absolutely. So we have got names for all our teams. They just we do need to do a piece of work around really embedding and using them. <laughs> Fine, OK, thank you. <laughs> uh, Jane. I think maybe just finally is just to say that um, obviously other, there have been key challenges but we have had some really positive feedback from ladies that have gone through the service who have been really keen to to share share how even though the service is under obviously key pressures the, the the staff in there have gone over and above to make sure that the ladies and their babies have had and their families have had a good experience and i know they have been shared with the staff but it's been very heartening to see that despite the challenges uh, the staff have risen and, uh, above that and have provided a really good service. I just wanted to make sure that the board were aware of that, that we are getting really positive feedback on the whole. Can I, can I just quickly on that is that we've, we also have of our women who've experienced um, loss and stillbirth with us over the last year, um, year to 18 months. Actually, there's quite a number of them now that are pregnant again, and they've chosen to come back and be under our care in the same teams, which is really encouraging. Um, you know, we're establishing those tripartite meetings to feedback along with HSIB, um, with the consultant um, obstetricians and, our, and our, our senior team, our quality and safety team. And some of those women as well have also voiced a, a wish to um, to have their patient stories heard as well. It's really encouraging um, to help inform, you know, some of the changes from that. So, yeah, it's a nice thing. Thank you, Emma. Right, I'm going to take chairman's privilege of the last <clears throat> couple of questions. Um, I think there's there's one probably uh, which is for uh, 
the midwifery team, which is I heard a, a very good patient story actually on the ICB the other day. It happened to be a Royal Surrey one, but but actually one of the big things that came out of it was the, and I think it's called the Bump to Baby Service, which is a community service provider. I know CSH are the ones providing it and it's health visitor driven. And I'm wondering to what extent we use that bit of service and, and our link to the community provider bit. So that's that's the first question. So we haven't launched that per se. We do have something that we've just <coughs> launched called Baby Buddy, um, which is a, a tool and an, an app for two way communication between the health professionals um, and the service users, if that's if that's what you're referring to. Yeah, I think I think it'd be worth from a Northwest Surrey point of view, um, just just talking to CSH about what what they're doing because they were you know they're like dogs with two tails when when the uh, thing came out um, and I've got a feeling it's it might, I might be wrong I know bump is in there I think it's some, <laughs> something around bump to baby but but don't quote me on it it was, um, it was it, bump to baby yeah it was wasn't it John yeah <laughs> Um, so the second one, I think for James, I was very pleased to see that the report included the NICU. Would it be safe to say my reading of that is they're facing many of the same staffing problems that midwifery are facing and obviously similar estate problems because they're on the top floor of the same building. Um, and I, I don't want us to lose that. Um, I want to, them to have equal prominence. You know, because as Gemma rightly says, they are the other jewel in the crown for us, uh, combined with the Labour ward. Um, and maybe there's even closer working needed in, in with them, actually. So I, I agree entirely. And um, part of the estate's um, plan is to improve and make the care and, and the flow of patient flow through the NICU. Uh, better help provide them with better storage, help provide them with better um, facilities, isolation, enable them to open all their beds properly. So the plan moving forward from an estate's perspective is has that in mind. And again, it's just waiting on the um, uh, the structural report. But from a, a nursing perspective, yes, they do have challenges. Hannah's just put her hand up, I can see. So it's undoubtedly going to make a, a, more, an, an uh, some comments on that. OK, yeah, because the thing that triggered me is is the thing that says weekend staffing, staffing not safe as per the weekday safe staffing. Yeah. That, and that, that's that kind of raised a flag in my in my mind. Uh, Hannah. So there's there's two different aspects. So that's referring to our junior doctors. So I'm sure you're aware that they were just successful in securing a bid for increasing their registrar levels. Yeah. So what that reflects is actually that they're now their junior junior, their SHA rotors. Um, they feel they need to increase. Um, so we've been hosting, we do week, uh, monthly walkabouts with Andrea anyway, but um, in light of recent events, we've started listening events. So I hosted one this week. And again, what was reflected in that is that their junior doctors are doing a lot of overtime, but increasingly less willing to do so. So the rotor gaps they experience <laughs> may be people choosing to work part time or sickness um, on top of the slight deficit there is in the new model that junior doctors are expected to work to is increasing in pressure. So that is one area that, that we will need to look at the business case for. And the other half of that is obviously the nursing model. Um, we have about 10 whole time equivalents um, vacancy in the nursing model at the moment, but put it in the context of that's about 75 to 80 nurses. Um, but we've just put all our posts out again, and I have spoke to my matron this week, and actually we've had a really successful pull on that. And um, what we do need to look at is our retention of our QIS nurses. We have an amazing unit. We train them up. We ITU train them, and they skip off to London. It's it's mm. it's a yearly challenge we face. So we're in that part of the year where we've recruited for those who will qualify in September, but you get a bit of a dip before you actually um, gain that. What we also have in place is a really successful program for our international educated nurses in NICU. Um, and from my perspective, as a senior ethnic minority leader, what I'm really proud of is that that goes right the way through to band seven level. Um, so they're really embedded and they come with amazing skills. We've just had another four team members join us um, in the last couple of months and they're embedding well. And you're seeing the benefits of that <coughs> come through the unit. So, yes, there are staffing issues. Yes, we've got a long way to go. 
but certainly the nursing workforce, I'm reassured that the plan is continuing. But we will keep, continue to keep providing listening events because you're right, the two units are so intrinsically linked that if there's pressure in one, we know there's pressure in the other. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And uh, just to finish this off, I'd just like to say thank you for all the hard work that is being put in at divisional level uh, and, uh, you know, at the individual unit level to the midwives, etc. Uh, everybody I know is is pulling in the right direction and, and the same direction. So thank you for that. And also thank you for, uh, as you put in the in the chats, for uh, support you've been giving Hannah and Ellen, I know, has been giving as well. So. So, you know, right that we discuss this at board level, uh, it's really important uh, and not just because of Ockenden. Actually, that's not the reason. The reason is that we need to keep our women and babies safe um, and give them the best possible experience. So uh, anything we can do from board level to help, we will do. Um, so thank you for that. OK, so we're going to move on now. Um, we'll briefly, uh, Jane, you've got a couple, you've got your minutes and annual report anything you want to uh, draw our attention to uh, on the minutes no they were approved at the last meeting um, if anybody's got any questions of course um, and the annual report uh, i like the format it's very uh, concise very very quickly summarizes uh, that we've um, discharged our responsibilities as a, a board subcommittee and that um, uh, our terms of reference haven't changed, so there's nothing really to highlight there. So I uh, just any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Jane. No, I like that format as well. I think it very, very clear. Um, you can you can see what what you're supposed to do in the terms of reference and then what you have been doing. So I think it's nice and neat. Any any questions for Jane, either on those minutes or on the annual report? OK, Jane, well done. Thank you. Um, so we now move on to the seven day hospital services program. Uh, the, this is the biannual report. We see this quite a lot. Uh, Jane, anything to say before we hand over to David, I guess? Uh, we, we saw this at the committee last week, just to say that the recommendations that are put forward in the report we endorsed. Uh, we were happy with those. So uh, obviously now for the board to consider. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jane. David? Yeah, I suppose the, the only thing to draw your attention to really is standard two, <clears throat> which is, um, you know, first review of patients uh, within 14 hours of their admission. Um, and that's been that's been deteriorating um, over the last um, over the last year, really. And actually, the this is quarter three report and we just we just looked at the quarter four data and it's it's at 58 percent. Now, the reasons behind that are um, a lot of the time, the, it's just been missed, so it's just falling out just outside the 14-hour time. Um, sometimes it's seen by a specialist registrar rather than the consultant, and sometimes there's not a record in the time, which which means that you then can't calculate it. So it's a, it's a myriad of things. I think it's a really important standard, and although they're saying that we don't have to report on this, um, certainly, when we've seen on our SI reports, we think that this is an important stand that we need to keep keep an eye on. I think the other thing to say is that I suspect that what's also driving this is it's the organisation of our emergency teams, and I know Tom's working on this, and it's to make sure that we do today's work today rather than some is left for review the next day. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to shift the um, the, the, the senior the senior put support further into the evening, particularly acute take within medicine, to make sure that all the daytime patients are seen in a timely way rather than just admitted and then reviewed afterwards. Um, I don't think there's anything else really to bring to draw your attention to there, but happy to take questions. Thank you, David. Any questions on this? Are we happy as a board to endorse the recommendations that the quality committee have also endorsed? Nod, yes. yes. Yeah. Yes. OK, all right. Thank you, David. That's good. Um, and that takes us to the volunteers annual report, Andrea. Brilliant. Uh, <laughs> 
Thank you. So, um, well, firstly, I think I'd just like to say a huge thanks to to our, our volunteers. I think this report really reflects the the work that they've done to to really help us as a trust in the response to, to COVID and particularly last year and being visible at our, our control points to the organisation, making sure individuals wear a mask and and have the temperature checks done down to going on towards and, and keeping families connected, uh, loved ones connected with with, with their with their uh, uh, families and also being involved, particularly when we've had reduced visiting, but also being involved with the booking uh, line that we've had in place as well. So in order to be able to control the visiting as we've relaxed, uh, relaxed our, our measures, which has been a, a lovely thing to do, but they've been absolutely pivotal um, around that. The, I suppose, just bringing out some key points of the report. Obviously, there is still is a big effort to to improve the recruitment uh, for our um, for our volunteers, and um, particularly uh, trying to to grab the young the youngsters in universities. Royal Holloway is a clear focus for us to be able to to recruit from. A um, bit bit to be good to emulate what the Royal Surrey do with um, the University of Surrey, but um, but also using the University of Surrey as well. And there's lots of work underway to. To, to do that. Um, volunteers have also been involved in a national project around around uh, flow. Um, we we from a regional perspective, we were asked to to look at utilising our volunteers in in sort of doing portering aspects. I suppose it's about moving patients from different areas to ensure that they you know they they move out of the organisation in a timely in a timely in the right in the right way. And uh, and that's been has been successful. And we now have got some volunteers that are based in ED and are doing a, a great job uh, in helping the flow uh, down there as well. We've got Volunteers Week, which is starting um, 1st of June, actually, and uh, we haven't been able to celebrate. Normally have a, a Christmas, big Christmas party for the volunteers, but because of COVID, we haven't been able to do that. But we are going to uh, during Volunteers Week and we've got an afternoon tea at, um, at, at, at Brookwood. So that's very exciting, actually. And we've had a donor um, who's given us um, £1,500 to be able to, to fund that day. So that's lovely. And areas to work on. There are areas for us to work on. The recruitment piece is really, really Im Im important. The the on the website, our volunteer section uh, needs to be to be improved. And clearly, that will help with re with recruitment as well. Um, uh, around around that. I mean, our ambition from a recruitment perspective is to have one volunteer for every every bed. Um, and the other bit that to, to work on is our annual plan and strategy as well. And that's uh, that's under development uh, development current, currently. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. Just say a huge thanks. I mean, they've they really have been um, a, a cohort of our staffing that that have just stepped up and really made a difference and really helped us get through what has been a very challenging and, and tricky time. And I'm you know very thankful for that. James. Thanks, Chair. And thanks, Andrea. That that's a fantastic paper. I really enjoyed it. I I think there was just a couple of points for me because it mentions around link and you mentioned about links up with university, but it mentions the younger end of the volunteers, not just the older end, which it both alluded to. But one of the things that didn't come out was the training opportunities to progress into employment. Because that is something that we're working on, isn't it? Part of being an anchor institution. And that this is a, a way for some people to secure a HCA job or 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 other type of role, isn't it? That's something that we could pull out and do a bit more with. Yeah, it's a good point, James. And and um, we could bring that out actually as to how many people we have had come to volunteer that have then gone on to to healthcare professional um, roles. So uh, you're right; it's a good hook in. Jane. Thank you. Uh, we were really pleased to receive this report at the Quality Committee and extended our thanks to the volunteers and, and their manager. Um, one of the things I, I thought assurance but did receive at the committee, but for the board to be aware is that often volunteers can help in areas um, where patients are waiting. So, for example, A&E emergency departments where they're waiting uh, and, and maybe aren't getting a drink or need help with a phone call to, to make arrangements for their pet or or, or, or child care, etc. And I was assured that the volunteers are, are now involved in that, which is excellent because they can actually help to make 
what is never nice when you're waiting, a, a better environment, at least from a comfort point of view. So I really wanted to say that's great that we've got them involved in, in, those, in those teams as well. So it was really just to highlight that work. Thanks, Jane. A couple of points, I think, from me. I think the report, the one thing that the report is lacking is sort of some facts and figures around, uh, you know, so how many volunteers have we got? How many have we gained, net gain over the last year? What's the age profile looking like? What age profile are we looking for? Um, so, so just to kind of get to grips with it at a more detailed level, I'm sure we've got all those figures, um, but that, that I would look for those in the annual report. And the second one, I think, Tom, I was wondering, you know, the extent we're talking about unis, but what about the Bourne Academy? What about this sixth form? Um, I don't know the legalities of anything under sixth form, what we can, can and can't do, but I do know that these youngsters are pretty good at tablets and things like that. And I'm thinking about our earlier conversation around patient feedback um, that for volunteers. And, you know, there may be areas, of course, we can't use under 18s or under 16s for, but perhaps we could use them in particular around guiding people through a tablet response or the viewpoint machines or, or whatever. Uh, what do you think? Uh, no, I think there's definitely potential in that, actually. And I think we should talk to the Bourne Academy and some of the other local education partners uh, about that. Um, <clears throat> I mean, our, our, our main area of conversation is around work experience and routes into mm. uh, health and care careers. But there's a continuum, isn't there, between volunteering yes. and getting that experience, making that contribution uh, and then getting kind of hooked into um, uh, into, in, into <laughs> careers. And as James has said, uh, we do see quite often actually volunteers come along and then take an opportunity to apply for a paid job and, and, and they're usually very successful in that. Um, the other thing I just mentioned while I've got the sort of floor is that the King's Fund published earlier this week, I think, a really good report on volunteering that I've circulated around a few people. Um, and, and that and that and that talks about a number of things that we're already doing, actually, but it has got a lot of helpful stuff in there. So developing a very clear strategy for volunteering, having the support of a volunteer manager, which we have got, uh, I think are really key things. So I think from a strategic perspective, we should have a look at this uh, and see how we can tie it in uh, and really uh, give the volunteers the best opportunity and and and, and maximise the impact of them for the for the patients and the staff. Okay, so happy to support that. Yeah, great. So so perhaps Andrea and Tom, if you could have a discussion around the kind of youngsters, are there legal barriers to uh, people volunteering? Younger ones, uh, Andrea, do you know? Well, the I suppose it's a it, sixteen so safeguarding, minimum. of course. Yeah, yeah, safeguarding perspective. Um, so there are some, yes, there are some um, bits around that. But I mean, the the university cohort is a brilliant eighteen yeah. and brilliant cohort to use. But I think those six formers certainly would seem to be. Yes, one. yeah, sixteen, okay. eighteen, yeah. All right. Anything else on the volunteers? I know, James, you've got to go soon, so we need, do need to tackle your performance report. Um, OK, so thank you for that report. Very, It is a good report. I think the, the only message is more facts and figures, please. Yeah, I yeah, got that. Thank, thanks, Andy. We'll do. Um, OK, so let's move on to the performance section. Um, Merrick, <laughs> with your modern healthcare hat on on the performance side, anything you want to draw our attention to before we give James his head? Well, I think the key thing to note is both in the March uh, meeting and uh, our March minutes and our more recent meetings is we are seeing um, coming out of um, all the problems of COVID, we are seeing really the ability to start to use all of that extra capacity that's been put in both recently, but actually long, in our longer term planning um, around uh, separation of hot and cold sites in the old parts and COVID, non-COVID sites now. And I think uh, we're going to see more of that. That is a real pleasure to see. And it's congratulations to um, the whole team there. And I think we're also seeing uh, really is covered in considerable detail in um, the uh, Chief Executive's report, uh, this focus on uh, the, the, the main effort, which will continue, yep. uh, I think, to drive in that space. So I, I think it's a very strong um, underlying per performance turnaround, really, that we're seeing here. And what already uh, was, in the context of the pandemic, an upper quartile performance, and more in some cases across the board for the hospital. So well done. Thank you, Marek. James. 
Thanks, thanks, Tia. Thanks, Mark. I, I, I will just pull out a few uh, areas, um, Chair, because we we do obviously have presented this to a number of forums really within the organisation. But March was a challenging month, so although we're in May and it's it's slightly better at the minute, um, March was a challenge. In fact, if you you know those of you who've read the detail of this report will see that March was our second busiest month. Now that's actually technically because we did a slight reporting change in March. Um, due to the navigation uh, process that we put in place, patient navigation, which serves to direct people straight to um, some of our urgent care areas rather than through the UTC or a &E. If we hadn't, and that that reporting change was put in three weeks into that month, so it, serves, it just sort of adjusts the numbers. If it hadn't been, this would have been by far, if it was like for like reporting, by far the busiest month that is on record. <laughs> attendances at Ashton St Peter's hospitals ever. So in that context to consider the performance of the urgent care department is is, is impressive. So there was a slight deterioration in performance in, in real terms. However, in terms of the paper um, throughout and at the back where we got the appendices does show that where we are achieving in relation to uh, other providers in the region and in the country. So we are still um, provided, you know, ensuring a, a comparatively strong performance um, despite the challenges that we had in, in March. And as has been said through a lot of the other papers, I'm not going to repeat it around the main effort. We can see the green shoots of that, certainly now. Um, but in March, we, we were still experiencing that challenge of um, high volumes, which was giving us um, pressures around uh, all the things that you can see in the paper, length of stay um, and ambulance delays. The COVID pressure was high in March for us still, and this wasn't something that was sort of widely recognised outside of healthcare. So through March, we had circa 63 uh, COVID inpatients at any one time. We had significantly more than that who were isolating, and of those beds, there's always around 20 beds that were open that we couldn't use. So, so there was distinct pressures in March. And that's important from that context when you consider the elective position as well, because we're in a lot of escalation areas, including one of the wards at Ashford that, that is uh, an elective ward. And we we're in there for urgent medicine, which stopped us um, going live with um, some of the elective work that we wanted to. So that's a kind of whistle stop of, of non-elective care and urgent care. The, the recovery plan that we have is, is in detail in the paper, and we can see some areas where that's beginning to get traction. In terms of elective care, the work is really beginning to blossom. So during March, the first week of March, the end of the first week, we came out of um, both wards, uh, Ashford, of our elective wards, so we were able to turn on our elective surgery uh, across the piece. And that's the first time we've been able to do that since the Christmas break. And um, because of winter pressures, because of the COVID surge at Christmas and all of those issues. So we've focused on the things that are in that elective plan and we detail them here. We're recovery on uh, right sizing the departments, on uh, complementing with insourcing and outsourcing where that's um, viable. We've looked at locum support, we look at additional clinics, we're looking at some weekend working and we're really trying to work on a focus, which is something that remains true now, a silver thread now is around productivity and utilisation of um, outpatients and theatres, because we know that we've got opportunity in both of those areas to to do things um, more productively, use out the DNA rates and that sort of stuff. So we're continuing to work on those. Elective activity was very strong. It's one of the strongest <coughs> ones we've had. So we're 111 percent adjusted down for our plan. So that was um, not only did we deliver the plan, but we delivered 11 percent more than the plan in terms of activity for March. So that was a, a good performance and strong, demonstrated strong recovery and strong grip. Where you will see and where we do need to keep an eye on things is where some of the weights are coming out So the P2 category, which is the um, patients waiting an operation or intervention that should happen within four weeks. Um, that the clinician feels should happen within four weeks. Those numbers are beginning to grow a little bit. So we've moved from 68 to just over 100. And the over 52 week position is still um, is, is, is shown some slight increase. However, when you look through the comparative tables in terms of electro activity, we are performing at the best if, or one of the best, if not the best uh, in terms of the region. And we're up a decile in terms of the country at the moment in terms of um, 18 week position. So some good stuff there. 
we do have the number of growing number of patients over 18 weeks for first consultation. That is something that we've um, highlighted through the committees and something that we've talked about here where we're putting in a, a safety element. We've got a new committee called the Patient Clinical Harms Oversight Group, which our current um, Chief of Patient Safety is working on with us around just making sure that we maintain safety on waiting lists that are significantly longer than they've been for around a decade. Uh, and just the final bit for me, Andy, is just in terms of uh, DMO1, which is still um, looking good. We said there would be a bounce, so we knew that there would be a slight deterioration in performance, but we we will track that down. It, we just said it was going to bounce a bit. It wasn't going to be a completely linear downward move. And in terms of cancer, the really good news is that following all the disruptions from COVID and the, the winter pressures and the uh, ramping up of all of our services to rep respond to the, the wave that we had in December, we've got a real grip of cancer services. So six out of the eight cancer standards are compliant for March. Now, importantly there, what we always say is that that is pr preliminary data because March is 62 days. We aren't 62 days away from March yet, so it's really hard uh, necessarily to do that, so to predict that accurately. So we are expecting, although it's not in this paper, but we are expecting the 62 position can be compliant um, after the reallocation of breaches is where we um, allocate between us and tertiary referral centres. So it's probably going to be seven, not six out of the standards that could be compliant. And the one we missed, which was the screening standard, was why one patient so a, a solid response around cancer this month, which is a, a good turnaround um, from some of the months that we've seen previously and building on last month where we saw improvement as well. Thanks, James. Questions for James. Julie. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, James. So for me, probably um, a, a comment a reflection and then a, and then a question so abs absolutely congratulations on the on the very comprehensive report which i like very much and um and also the levels of performance and the key areas that you've pulled out i think it is a really strong performance um so well done on that i think in some ways it's it's a brilliant illustration of the key initiatives that we've all talked about in terms of those main efforts and, and other initiatives really, really starting to bite. And I, I suspect as we go forward, because obviously it's very it's always retrospective, isn't it, that we'll see more of that um, in, in terms of the green shoots. And and as we go forward with those bed capacity solutions that we are focusing on very much with our system partners at place, to provide, then hopefully we'll see more of that. Because if we get bed occupancy in the right place and flow in the right place, then, uh, well, we haven't solved everything, but we're on a really good position. So that that's what we need to see going forward. I suppose I just wanted to put into the mix the conversation that we're having on the financial position um, and our current deficit, because clearly performance needs to go hand in hand with finances and clearly quality and safety. Um, the work that we need to do in terms of identifying the additional cost improvement programmes, um, as we've said previously, we will do the quality impact assessment, but we need to have really good conversations if, if we feel that some of the things that we aren't able to take forward and that we need to pause, or if there are workforce changes, and um, what impact potentially they might have on ongoing performance metrics. Say, for instance, back, backlog surveillance capacity. If there's further work that we need to do around that, looking at agency costs, looking at WLIs, and um, clearly we just need to put that all into the mix, have the read across, understand the risk, do the quality impact assessments, and all be completely aligned on why we've made those choices and what we need to do going forward. So that that, that was my comment piece. Um, just in terms of a question, James, um, recognising we've got Surrey Safe Care now, which is absolutely brilliant, that is going to cause a bit of a hiccup in terms of our business continuity. And I, and I know we've planned for that. Do, do you have a sense of a forecast position around how much Surrey Safe Care launch will impact on our key performance metrics, please? Thanks. Thanks, Judy. So we we have an idea. So we, we've made um, adjustments to um, some of the areas that we can make adjustments to. So we're in, in for Surrey Safe Care, we know that it's going to 
going to give us a burden of time on the wards and for doing all, all sorts of things across the organisation, booking appointments, administrative burden, uh, tasks as well. So where we have had the, where we've been able to reduce activity, we've done that. So in outpatients, we have made a slight reduction to the first three clinics that people are doing and uh, to electives, we've reduced the time a little bit for theatres for the first couple of weeks. So we have built that into the plan. So as part of the financial plans, we built that in. So in terms of our clock stop requirement and our plan for April, all being well, and if we don't have to carry those plans forward, which we're prepared we might need to do if if you know if the business need drives us to slow down a bit more for another week, we'll have to do that. But as plans currently stand, they are reflected in in what we think we'll deliver in April. In terms of the outcomes for that, um, cancer will be unaffected because we'll continue to prioritise that, as should be the long waits. So the only thing that we're looking uh, at, at deleterious impact on would be the RTT uh, performance. That's that's a that's very much the plan and the uplift in staffing that we've wrapped around the urgent care services should support us in terms of retaining some of the good levels of performance that we've seen. Okay, Thank you James and I know that, that this week you and your team have put a lot of focus in terms of particularly getting the emergency department and bed occupancy into the right position to go live so, so lots of mitigations in place there so well done thank you. Thank you. James can I just a couple of things from me um ambulance handovers as i noticed that you know this is this month was up again and it's probably our third highest month for ambulance delays <coughs> i know that ccam you know have many other trusts in the southeast who are much worse at this point but but have you got any sort of comments on you know obviously you're seeing the data day to day now this is this was yeah. march uh, as to how we're progressing on ambulance handovers yeah, so significantly better. The the challenge we had through March, and we we <coughs> talked about every single month, but March was no different. March was incredibly difficult because we were experiencing Omicron, which was it had a level of transmissibility far higher than other levels of of, of COVID in the organisation. So we've been able to contain covid you know in across society and in the organization in in different ways previously and the outbreaks that we experienced and across society were different in march so we did we were having more exposure we had more exposure we had beds that we were had people that were isolating in so that was a challenge it really was and it was the busiest month that we've ever had um it is significantly better in may um april was i, I think april did have some challenge but but where we are now is we're significantly better than that. OK, in fact, probably I would say so far it may minimal. OK, and the second question was really obviously related to both finance and operational efficiency um, was kind of progress towards the 104 um, percent. Yeah. And uh, also the theatre utilisation. Yeah. So, so what was the question? Only how are we doing? Well, it's, uh, how we how we doing? You know, because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very key to, that we get to the hundred and four percent, and and theatre utilisation is is a major part of that, isn't it? Yeah, it is absolutely. As is the outpatient DNA rate. They're they're both in that way. The outpatient side and the theatre side are the same. So, um, theatre utilisation is is really important to us. I think the challenge that we had, which was really unfortunate, was we built up a real head of steam um, as we moved in towards mid-December, at which point there was another Omicron surge, or uh, sorry, COVID surge, and we had to take down all of our theatres and we had to redeploy the staff again across uh, critical care and other components of the organisation. So when we were ready, at that point where we were going live with the programme that we've worked on with Four Rise, we then had to pause and in reality we didn't turn on full elective care until uh, March so that was unhelpful in terms of timing but we are back on it now we are reinvigorating <coughs> the the plans around um, how we utilize theatres how we do the 642 which is our booking the attention that we pay at every level of pay at every level of management to that and out on the day cancellation so all of that things are, are being looked at in terms of outpatients our dna rate is something that we're looking at as well 
a number of strategies around how we can do that. I think in the immediate term, the things about our letters, timing, we are moving to an entirely new system in 24 hours and, and we need to bed that in as well. OK, thank you, James. Any other questions for James? James, I think you said you had to go at 12.30, so 12.33, so not too bad. No, that's it. So the CERN I go live depends on me chairing the next meeting, so I need to get it. Thank you. All right, thank you, James. Thanks, bye-bye. Um, so Merrick, uh, Modern Healthcare uh, Minutes. Yes, yeah, just to touch on this lightly, because the operational aspects we've already uh, talked about. Um, clearly financing has been and will continue to be uh, a critical focus as we look forward and we anticipate uh, potentially speaking um, even outside of our regular program on this i think actually as uh, julie has, has noted the where operational capability problems and capacity meets finances i think is going to be you know clearly a major point of focus and challenges we look forward and I, I think really all I would say is um, you know we're going to be watching the space and be reporting closer on where we get to next time uh, with John chairing committee. Okay thank you. Any questions on those minutes from uh, Modern Healthcare? No? Okay um, in which case we've then got the people <coughs> uh, Dami. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I'll take the March minutes from the People Committee as read, and they've been approved at the May meeting we had last week. Um, the committee uh, was assured that there's a lot of work underway to try and address our people risk. Uh, the, uh, there's a lot of work going on with trying to map out what our workforce requirements are across staff groups, although the particular focus has been more so on the nursing and midwifery workforce to ensure that we're able to meet the rising demands that we have for, for care across the organisation. We have a stable turnover of staff. But as you've heard uh, throughout the uh, board meeting, there's a huge recruitment, or you may not have heard, there's a huge recruitment uh, effort going on, uh, including from overseas, as well as uh, a retention plan that's really focused um, on considering more options for flexible working, for promotion and career development or career progression, because these are some of the issues that have been highlighted from our recent staff survey. We, we know that uh, more people are thinking of leaving uh, within the next uh, year, uh, just like there is across most parts of the NHS. Um, on a positive note, uh, we, we know also from the survey that um, the wellbeing offers uh, have been well received by our staff. Um, but we continue to work hard on trying to improve morale, engagement, uh, career progression op uh, options, as I discussed, and um, tackling bullying and harassment. So in last week's meeting, we sought further assurance on these issues, but we were also presented at the committee with some further information about the culture improvement programme that's due to launch shortly and the improving people practices, which allows us to review our employment relations processes and ensure that there is a just and inclusive culture, something that's much needed within our organisation at the moment. Um, I'll pause at that and leave uh, Karen to talk about a bit more detail. Unless anybody has any questions. So any questions for Dami on, on the actual minutes before we give Karen uh, her opportunity? No, Karen, you carry on. <clears throat> sorry, I wasn't aware that I was going to be uh, picking up on that. So sorry, Dami, you were just talking about all the well-being and so forth as well, weren't you? And actually we have done some really good stuff uh, in the organisation on well-being. Um, and yeah, with the staff surveys and so forth, we're doing a lot of work around the recruitment and retention and actually just picking up again with the maternity side of stuff. We're really working and supporting on that. 
Um, to be fair, I don't think I have that much more to add, to be fair. Sorry, Dami, I think you've kind of covered quite a lot of the information there. Um, but yeah, if there is any more questions or anything else that I can add, uh, please do ask. I've got a couple for you, Karen, yeah. just, just so you don't get bored. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm all good. <laughs> um, first one is, have we got a date for uh, the catering offer opening at Ashford? And the second yeah. one is a date for the Wellbeing Centre opening at Ashford. So because I'm really keen that we, you know, we replicate the great work we've done in St Peter's at Ashford. Yep, so great news. The Wellbeing Hub at Ashford is open. Ah, uh, yep, excellent. the um, it's quite hot off the press. So the atrium area as you walk into the education centre <laughs> uh, has all been decked out. So the furniture came last week uh, and we've already had staff utilising it and some great feedback as well because the, the furniture is pretty much exactly the same as we've got at St Peter's. Um, people have been eating their lunch in there, have just been going for a bit of time out, a bit of space. Um, and the catering side of thing, I think it's been pushed back till autumn. We're doing some work again around that. I'm just looking to see. Um, I think we've got to do the build. Obviously, Surrey Safe Care will come out in the next couple of weeks. Um, we're looking at the furniture. We're going to try and get some chairs and so forth in there so people can can eat. Um, we're trying to make sure the offer is the same and have a bit of a fun element at Ashford as well. So we've got a pool table that will go in there, a football table, just to make sure, like I said, it is pretty much exactly the same offer. Um, so we're just trying to see how we can fit it all in. But I believe the catering side of things is being pushed back a little bit just towards the end of summer, early autumn. Yeah, that's disappointing if that's the case. Um, Andrea. It was just to, to reiterate, actually, on Friday, obviously having the Pride of Nursing Day over at Ashford, uh, we did get to see the the new atrium and the well. It's lovely, actually, I have to say. It's been a super, super job that's done there. Uh, it's actually transformed it. Um, so, yeah, and it's great to hear that, obviously, that's got getting used um, well, uh, Karen. That is disappointing about the food, because that is a, when I go around chatting to staff, that is one of the big, you know, the bugbears mm -hmm. uh, around the food bit. But um, at least it's the, there is a plan to... To address. Yeah, there is. There is. Sorry, yeah. I think there is a 24 hour uh, option that we're looking at, the 24 seven hour uh, option that we were looking at, which was get back getting some <coughs> vending machines in. And that's for both Ashford and St. Peter's. I think, again, an issue around that with St. Peter's side of things is just where to put it. Um, but I think we're looking at that to get that in at Ashford a little bit earlier. But they actually the um, those who've been in the education centre, if you turn right, the room there has got a, a an old kitchen with a bit of a dumb waiter. So we're just looking to kind of renovate that. So I think it's just, I think it might just be around kind of the capital side of things and the state side of things of getting that in process. But the plans are there. Um, I think it's just a bit of time. And just another point, gym facilities, is that... So that's the problem we do have at the moment. We don't have a space for gym facilities at Ashford, which I know has been um, a bit of feedback from staff. I mean, obviously they can use the St. Peter's one. Anyone can use the St. Peter's one, but getting across to it. We did originally look at the physio gym at Ashford, but um, I mean, that is in use for uh, patients. So I think that was just one of those that we, in the nicest possible way, a little bit in the too difficult box of how to kind of get it available for staff and patients at the same time and so forth. So um, it's just, it, yeah, the, the, the gym probably remains the one that might just be a little bit up in the air, unfortunately. Thanks, thanks Karen. I wonder, Tom, Tom, have you got any uh, more knowledge on this catering at Ashford? The issue, I think, is just with the delay to the refurbishment around the kitchen i think as karen said sorry i had to just step aside there. um the uh, the vending solutions i think is hap happening and and we're also improving the offer through the uh the, the sort of the front entrance cafe there there at ashford so there are improvements that have been been made i think with the obviously there's been a lot of um um uh there's, there's a lot of still uncertainty around the capital plan for ashford because of the ashford elective center and i think the catering bit of it's probably got tied up a bit with that OK, but well, I'm happy to, to, to get a fuller update and, and share that with you. I, th I think the I think the board would be uh, aligned around, you know, the sooner we can get, you know, more equivalents at Ashford, the better. Clearly, you know, there, there will be barriers, but if we can accelerate things, particularly around the food, we should. And I know that Surrey Safe Cares, obviously taking every little, I think Julie said yesterday, you know, you, you open a cupboard and you've got somebody there who's working <laughs> on very safe care at the moment. Um, so I'm hoping that that will improve. Uh, David. Yeah, it's it just along that because the, the other 
thing that we're considering is the uh, the cafe and outpatients and extending the hours of that. And I suppose that is something we can do relatively quickly. We just got to uh, assess the cost and the the footfall and those kind of things. But the footfall in Ashford is is built up massively, and it's going to build up a lot yeah. more as well. So. So I think it's a different situation to to pre-COVID, yeah. but we're we're working our way through that, aren't we, Simon? And Tom. Yeah, yeah. I think the cafe and outpatients last time I looked were still shut. Um, you know, yeah, so that, that that's is. yeah. Okay, I think there's opportunity there, um, Julie. Thank you, Andy. Uh, and uh, I, I'm sort of looking at future demand and it may be, not be directly related to this paper, Karen, but I, I'm sort of triangulating the conversations that we've had around development of workforce, volunteers, apprenticeships or, you know, all, all these opportunities to develop a, a, a right size appropriate workforce for, for our demand both now and in the future and I'm sort of picking up on various conversations I know Tom is having various conversations with Penny at the Bourne Academy and I'm going out there as well and I'm sure you're hooked into that and um, Jack Wag Wagstaff from a place perspective is really keen to talk to me about development of, of workforce opportunities uh, can can I just have assurance that we're sort of all aligned on this and, and we've got some principles and some priorities? Yes. And, and we're all kind of interfacing and and talking to each other, because on the one hand, it's a fabulous opportunity. But just, you know, day day seven in, it sort of feels as if there's um, potentially separate silos going off in slightly different directions. And how do we coordinate ourselves? Or you tell me that we are coordinated and I'm just mis misreading it. Thank you. I'm happy just to jump in. I mean, I know I actually met with um, the Bourne Education Trust just literally yesterday as well on some apprenticeship work. Um, to be fair, they wanted some advice and guidance from us on how we're how we're utilising our levy. Um, and actually, from that conversation, we came up with some conversations around doing some pipelines, um, working with their students of how we can get them in to do some T level apprenticeships. So we absolutely are linking in with the system. Um, a part of the just kind of the rework of the way HR are doing and how we work with the Alliance, we're going to get a post in or get some support in around the grow your own strategy for the whole of the Alliance. Um, so I'm kind of picking up a little bit at the moment. We're working on work experience, uh, working within the system on work experience and kind of getting some kind of some kind of tight lines around work experience to make sure that actually we give our catchment area and our local students the opportunity to kind of work with us as first point of call and then we can broaden it. So there is a whole load of work going on and I know a few of us are kind of working with with different people in the alliance so um as part of Louise's overarching strategy yes we are all we are all on it okay thank you and we're, and we're talking to health education England as well because we we could be a bit of a trailblazer in this and actually develop some some new workforce um models really you know in in terms of some of the historic models yeah this there's loads of opportunities and it is and it is it's to be honest it's really great working with the Vaughan Education Trust but we've got Salesians across the road as well who are really keen, really keen to work with us um, and Woking College so to be fair there's a number of schools and, and education I think now we're back from Covid everyone's chomping at the bit so um, we're hoping that creates some opportunities. Thanks so John. Well, I actually to build on that conversation is just wonder whether we could actually influence some of the the disciplines that they have within some of the colleges around some of the things that they're actually putting out there and training as a, as a sort of a feeder for us and in terms of being a self-sustaining community so that's one of the things i, I did want to um now on if that's the sort of conversation that you're having with them Karen. yeah so sorry just also to say um and, and originally david and tom were involved in these conversations with lord Mawson. we've actually got um the science teachers come in and working with us in our medical education team in the simulation labs. So we're actually teaching on site here and we're doing some competitions as well. So yes, we are linking in with specialisms. Um, there's a massive push around our allied health professions uh, and getting some more people into those areas. Uh, and that's part of the T-level apprenticeships that we want to look at. Um, and a couple of the co colleges and schools are hopefully offering T-level apprenticeships. And with that, that means they do the apprenticeship and the learning at school, but actually they come on placement here. So we want to pick up some of those relationships where we host the placements. And I think one of the key areas we'll be looking at will be AHPs to start off with. 
All right, okay. And I, I know that we have got some real, sh again, shiny examples where you know we can really excite people that come in in terms of around the education centres, etc. So I think they're they're really good. Sorry, I, I meant to ask a question before in terms of the report on um, just around uh, staff survey and results and things. It, I, I, this may be me just reading between the lines as, as to how the report's been written. Um, but there, there was a thing, and, it, and it's great to actually see some of the uh, feedback in terms of um, uh, obviously people feeling that they are um, being listened to and acting on concerns. But it was the comment that says, where appraisal have, have, under, have, under been, have been undertaken, they have felt valued, which sort of just <laughs> implied to me that there were probably appraisals that haven't been undertaken. Is it possible to get an update as to where we are on those sort of things? Uh, we're about 68% of appraisals being undertaken across the trust. Um, we did a bit of a push throughout COVID to have um, wellbeing conversations where actually if somebody had a wellbeing conversation, we would pretty much class that as, as the appraisal because at that time wellbeing was one of the key things we wanted to make sure our staff were supported on. Um, but yes, we... We, we need to do some more work around appraisals and um, there's a whole load of things that we have to kind of include in appraisals now um, linking to to various things, wellbeing, talent and so forth. So the paperwork and so forth is going to be revised. What we want to do is focus on the conversation and ensure that everybody's having a conversation. And so the comment where it alludes to the fact that we're appraisals have been happening, they've been doing well is great because actually people who are having those appraisals are finding that they are, you know, positive and actually helping them. But no, it is well spotted. Absolutely. We need to do some more work on our appraisals and actually encouraging people to do them. And I think we're in a good position now as we come out of COVID um, to, to restart that process. All right. OK. And, and sorry, this is a really picky point by me again okay. in terms of the um, it says 400 and 4,045 staff invited, 1723 completed, and that's a 55% return rate. Um, it's great maths, but I'm, I'm not too sure if it, this is right. She says, being there, I will double check the maths, I'll double check what it came through. <laughs> that might just be a slip. Actually, I think that has actually been picked up from somewhere else. Yes, it was 55. I will say it was 55 percent people of 55 percent of people who did complete. So I think there's just a slip in the maths there on the on the report. So I will just go back and recheck Don't that. Worry. Make sure you get Sorry, the correct. Just been very, very big. No, 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 it's absolutely fine. To be fair, I think that has been picked up before um, and it probably just hasn't been amended. But yeah, we did have 55 percent of people complete, which yeah, to be fair was really good because again, yeah. that was quite a high result for us um, within our within the acute and community trust um, group. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. We like picky, John. That's good. Sorry. It's all good. Um, That's we so like good. picky. That's good. Um, Andrew. You're muted, Andrew. Yeah, I think that was a helpful conversation, but as your critical friend, I have to say, I think Julie has put her finger a bit on an issue because I do think um, the NHS can be a bit of a mysterious world to those outside it and a very bureaucratic world which can talk a lot, but sometimes actually isn't very good with the outside world in putting the practical actions together. And I think that actually it is now really important with the Bourne Academy and Partners that we really get practical, that when you have a meeting, it leads to practical actions that are then seen to be followed through on. Because these partnerships, I mean, on a number of things we've been talking to today, fantastic opportunities around midwifery, volunteering, the whole science programme that we just launched this week at Brooklands with Brian Cox, you know, real opportunities. But we must now put a practical action plan together that ties people together where one meeting leads to then actions. I think that's going to be really important. I think the Grow Your Own programme that we're starting to work on with Louise is again a real opportunity. And I'm just starting to do some work, the beginnings of how we really tie that into the business world around the hospital so that all these professional skills and opportunities um, start to create pathways into work, etc. So, Julie, it would be really good when you get to the point where you feel we can have some space to sit down to start to think through how do we put the mechanics in place. And I think Tom's had a really helpful conversation, I know, with Penny from the school. I think the Bourne Academy are really very good and very entrepreneurial and good people to work with. And it's great Tom's picked that up. But I do think we now need to make it very practical. I know that that's what they're wanting to see. And that there's great opportunities in all of that, I think. 
okay, okay thank, thank you. you i think we will draw it to a close there looking at the timings um but thank you dami and thank you karen um so we're going to move on to digital now so in the absence of chris ketley uh i think simon you're going to just uh, this is just the minutes yeah, they're there to be received, but essentially there was four topics in an extraordinary meeting. Obviously, sorry, safe care was the, the key one at that point. Uh, I will just note that most of it's out of date now in terms of those actions. They've obviously been resolved and we talked about two bids, digital pathology and digital imaging, which were referred to the closed session of the board for a further discussion. And uh, we also went through our kind of next three to five years digital developments and the kind of roadmap that we work on behind the scenes. So we, we were starting essentially to pull everything together. Um, Andy, I think was the theme of the meeting. But uh, that's okay. all I probably need to draw to your attention. OK, thank you. And obviously I couldn't be at that digital uh, meeting because uh, I had family commitments. But the one thing that sprang out for me was that the uh, the system development that has been most problematical for us, RotorGeek, had not gone through digital committee. And uh, there's a learning there, isn't there, that sort of says from a uh, from a point of view of governance, uh, everything uh, on, you know, system based should come through that committee. Um, and this isn't having a go at HR because I know that there, there were all sorts of uh, issues around allocate finishing and all the rest of it, but it has been problematical. We've seen it in maternity problematical and there's there's the thread that it, it never actually went through digital. So so I don't know what you think about that, Simon. Um, I, I would welcome it. There's two sides to this. I, I, I encourage everything digital to come through that committee, but also I, I encourage our ownership of all those digital. Yeah initiatives wherever there are that there's always an IT a technical aspect uh, uh you know implementation or challenges and and support that can be put in uh, there's a lot of stuff that's owned locally and even those we we need to get a you know a proper input into yeah. and get that two-way communication going so all I'd add is two-way uh, is, yeah. is what supports it basically yeah and I think from a, from a policy point of view I think we just lay down it has to it ha you know no, nothing gets uh, funded unless it's on the digital committee's kind of agenda and on you know Laura's agenda in particular. Um, uh, Jane. Thank you. I, I was just going to um, mention Rotogeek, but also uh, we know we've just highlighted some issues with Badgenet and its um, compatibility. So it's just making sure that we make sure that these risks are are going through the committee, not not necessarily needing the detail at this at the board, but just just to be assured that the risks that the clinicians is finding on the ground are are, are, are clearly articulated in the risks at the committee. Yeah, and as Simon said earlier, the Badgenet uh, Cerna one was a known, definitely a known risk, um, whereas the Road to Geek ones came and kind of bit us uh, from behind, so to speak. Um, John. No, I was going to mention the same thing actually about Road to Geek and the digital roadmap. Um, I just wondered, is there a read across to any other areas, Simon, that we might be finding other things out there in terms of islands of technology? Uh, probably the system wide integration would be the other challenge. So, you know, making sure uh, that wherever digital is developed, that it does feed through that you know that committee in a sensible way and all perspectives are are, are pushed around uh it's not just the internal the challenge there's an external element to that uh, i think john um that's what i'll say off the top of my head i can give it some wider thought if there's anything more specific around that no right i guess my concern is actually around you know continuity of if there's an issue with these local systems and then who picks that up um yeah, there, there always is. Uh, an example that cropped up this week would be within the urgent treatment centre. Adastra was going through various upgrades. Um, they'd planned that system wide. Uh, they picked Monday, uh, the go live day of Surrey Safe Care, to try and do that. Uh, that wasn't a good idea. Um, so, no criticism of the rest of the system, but it, it's a good example where, you know, joining up can be challenging and trying to just keep an eye on everything when it's coming from so many different angles at the same time. 
pathology would be another example. There is wide ranging upgrades and developments going on that tend to nibble away at, across different partners uh, and cause challenges. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a it's it's a moving feast, uh, and we need to be always on it. So yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Simon, for stepping in for Chris there. Um, okay, we'll move on to regulatory, um, and we're on the oh yes, our old friend, the NHSI uh, self certification, David. Are you then? Yeah, no, I'm here. It's the routine yeah. statements, if it's helpful, David. Um, we do these submissions uh, every year. There's a, there's a fair amount in the detail. I'd, I'll take that as read, um, but essentially we're compliant on, on all aspects of their requirements, and hence we're just looking for approval of that, Andy. And has this been, which committee has this been through? Do, 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 do. Quality? I don't think it. I don't. I don't think it does. I think because it's a it's a routine statement, it comes straight to here. Would be my my view of it. I'll just look around the group to see if anyone else has seen it go anywhere. Else. Sal, you'd know for definite, wouldn't you? It 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 doesn't go through um, any committee in its entirety, Andy. But um, the only thing, the only main point um, that we would probably pull out of this one is that it now refers to the CQC um, visit in November last year and the fact that we have an action plan in place, which of course is overseen by the Quality of Care Committee. So in its component part, um, aspects of this are overseen by board subcommittees. And of course, the action plan also came to board in March. So that's, okay. that's the only point of note within this um, annual round. Which triggering a neuron for me, I'm guessing that the next board meeting we should have an update on the CQC plan. If we can make sure yeah. of that one. Simon? Yeah, I was just going to add the paper itself got a bit confused on some of the dates, particularly around the 22-23 planning round that it was referring to. I, I, I think in there, maybe I can pick up with Sal afterwards and just tidy those up. Yeah, let's, I mean, if it's a formal, so it doesn't it doesn't go away, does it? So it's, it's, it's filed. It's not no. correct. No. It, yeah, it's exactly. not submitted. We have to um, we have to um, publish it on our website and and we can be selected as a cohort of trust to be audited. So, um, we so, so if we can to... just pick it up before it's published, we'll just yeah. correct Absolutely. those. Yeah. They were only minor, but it, Thanks, it was Simon. kind of yeah. a year out of date in a few aspects. OK, so thank you. Anybody got any other points on the NHSI self certification? No, this is for approval, but so on the grounds that uh, Simon and Sal are going to go through it and just pick up any minor date things, uh, are we happy to approve that? Yeah. OK. Um, <clears throat> standing orders. They say, oh, this has got me on, on, on here. That's interesting. That's how you've, you've, what have you let me in for? Um, <clears throat> I can step in as well if that's helpful. No, it's all right. I, I, I'm aware of this. Um, yeah, so the, we've, the bits in red are the additional bits that, we, that we've put in. Um, so these are the very standard things that we look at every year. I think I picked up something, though. Um, it was only a minor typo, but I did pick up something. Yes, there it is. Uh, now, in um, 2.6.1, uh, last sentence reads, the board, the board could appoint the deputy cha chairman to this position. So if we could delete the first, the board. That's the only one I picked up. Um, it, in Marcin's absence, I felt I had to go through the detail. Anybody else uh, got any points on that? OK. So that is also for approval. So, yeah, I'm taking that as read. And we then have the board register of interests. And so, so I'm going to be reasonably formal about this and say, are these uh, um, accurate as, a, as they are? 
stated for you all individually. I know you've made individual returns, but it is really, really important that the register of interest is accurate and obviously is on our website, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So speak now if you think your entry needs any adaptation. Nope. So we will receive that. Sorry, Sal, I'm going to go back again to the, the SOPs because my finger has finally worked through uh, getting to that. Um, the bit we added until such time as any UK procurement legislation was adopted. Does the health and social care bill being adopted change that? Is the question. I can't answer that off the top and of I, my I head, you, but I will go I know, away and answer it. I know you can't, uh, but it's because obviously part of that bill is around procurement. It is around uh, not automatic, but whether that is the whole answer, I don't know. But can we can we look at that, please? Thank you, Andy. Sorry to have to go back. That's uh, my flicking through, not catching up with my brain. Um, OK, so register of interest we've received. Anything on the trust seal, Simon? Uh, just to say we'd released Carla from <coughs> West site um, final land kind of sale conditions we'd received. I uh, can't, remember, can't remember the exact number. It was about six and a half million, six point six million as the final payment. Um, so essentially, as we noted in the close side of things, that just leaves us with the roundabout planning um, <coughs> as at the front of the site. Uh, yeah, uh, conditions to fulfill in due course, but they're no longer linked to the Carla okay. uh, sales and, uh, you know, houses uh, okay. on that site. So, um, yeah, good news all around, really. So summary for the open board is, uh, yep, we've received all the money uh, from the uh, land sale and the Section 106 monies are a weight uh, as getting a satisfactory um, position for the roundabout in terms of cost, etc. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, that's fine. And that takes us to any other business. I've not been notified of any other business, but has any board member got any other business they wish to raise? No. So we've had a couple of questions from uh, the public, from uh, Rosemary Moore. Um, I'm going to, uh, in James's absence, the first question, uh, which is in the papers, but basically was around step down beds. And uh, we answered the question last time that uh, the social care uh, allocated people for uh, to where they went to. And Rosemary was wondering, you know, what what you know, how many patients have died, to, you know, in, in these settings, etc. Um, and also wondering why Parklands Manor isn't being used. And, and the answer to this is this is a Northwest Surrey Alliance um, thing to take on. We we currently don't monitor people once they have been transferred out of our care, unless they come back into our care, of course. That is not to say we shouldn't as a system. And I think if uh, if I could ask that this is uh, sort of taken to the Northwest Surrey Alliance and just considered, Julie, please, uh, in terms of the you know the overall question, because you know just because patients are out of our care doesn't mean that you know we shouldn't look at them as a whole from an alliance point of view. So um, so I think that was a as a good a fair question uh, actually from uh, from Rosemary. The second one is I'm afraid not relevant to us because it's about the Abraham Cowley unit. Um, uh, why isn't it being used to assess patients with mental illness who present at St Peter's Hospital? Well, that's because um, we do that in our emergency care where where Surrey and Borders have got a permanent uh, residence. Uh, and uh, they provide that there. And the use of Abraham Cowley is obviously a Surrey and Borders affair, not our affair. So um, that that should be taken up with uh, Surrey and Borders. And then and then um, we have uh, in the, the various Carla brochures, which are, are actually not relevant to the discussion. So those that's the uh, answers for all the questions from the public. 
So that takes us through to reflection. Any reflections on today's meeting? Julie, you, this is your first open board. Any any thoughts from yourself? Sorry, I was just struggling with my mouse there. Um, yes, well, for me, uh, a, it's been really lovely to um, meet some of, of you that I haven't met um, in any great detail so far. So that's been really brilliant. But I think that there's something in terms of my fact finding and understanding the position. Today's been incredibly helpful <coughs> to to sort of triangulate a lot of the opportunities and the issues. And uh, at the same time, as we find ourselves in this challenging position, there really are huge opportunities. And clearly, both at a place and a system level, we are we are in a really good position to transform services and, and really make a significant difference for patients uh, across the patch. And clearly, there's an awful lot of work that has been done and is being done. I think that my reflection and I think exec colleagues will probably feed this back. I, I keep sort of posing the questions. Yes, but, you know, wh where where is the operational plan of the great ideas and 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 the things that we've agreed that we are going to take forward and the work that we're doing and that's being enhanced by PwC? What is it that we're actually going to take forward as a system, both at place and, and across systems? So, you know, today I've heard about the maternity opportunities, that clearly stroke opportunities. I don't know where our, our hazus are across the patch uh, and rehabilitation, but there may well be opportunities for that and clearly workforce as well. So just, you know, a few areas that I can um, start to think about in terms of how we need to get the right people around the table, um, Dami's words, and, uh, and really think about that fully integrated system approach. So I'm feeling incredibly positive and optimistic about the opportunities. So uh, yeah, that's brilliant. And I've, I've just seen Simon's smiling face at the same time as we're going forward with Surrey Safe Care as well. So as always, that's why we do these jobs because we're spinning lots of plates at the same time. Um, but yes, a, a really good meeting and I've enjoyed it. So thank you. Thank you. And Andrew, as our critical friend and board advisor. Muted. Right. Yeah, I think it's been a really good meeting, obviously, with real challenges, and it's great to hear those points, Julie, because I do think those are really the points and the opportunities actually for the next stage of this journey, which is very exciting. I think just a thing on the finance, I mean, I think I've lived through 25 restructures of the NHS, and I've heard many, many times, as I expect many of us have, these all issues about finance and the crisis of finance and the endless going round in circles of the NHS. I mean, this problem actually does provide, in my view, a real opportunity for innovation and to grasp the moment and for something different. And Andy and myself and Suzanne and Tom and colleagues have been talking with government and others about the opportunities of all of this, but it does need to be grasped and the moment is now. You know, the real danger is that we just move money around, go around and do a shuffle the deck chairs and nothing fundamentally change. I think we have the elements uh, of doing something in Northwest Surrey, which has real significance, but it will only happen if we choose to do it. And the finance issue is probably the real opportunity to think very radically about that matter. Um, so I just share that thought with you. It's not a journey in a circle, I suspect we all know. It's something else that needs to happen. And the practical devil and the detail will be what it's all about. Hope that's yeah, helpful. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. And I think there's nothing like a burning platform to encourage change. Um, and I think it's down to us, as we've always done as a trust, to kind of help lead exactly, the thinking Andy. across the Surrey Heartlands, um, and particularly around the provider collaborative piece, I think. Um, so. No, from my point of view, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for your energetic participation. Um, that's very good. Really good to see numbers of governors and indeed ex-governors here today uh, to uh, witness the board meeting. Lovely to see you. And uh, I will actually declare this meeting shut 15 minutes early. So take 15 minutes of your life back and we will see colleagues uh, on the Strategic Change Committee, I think, at two o'clock. OK, thank you.
Thank you, Andy. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, you very Andy. much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.